Okay, a warm welcome to everyone and thanks for joining us today for our workshop on the topic rabbits and robots debating the rights of animals and artificial intelligences. My name is Raphael Fazel. I am the co-founder and executive director of the Cambridge Centre for Animal Rights Law and sorry for being a bit late. Um, now this workshop here is the second one in a series that our centre has been organising during the pandemic and in which we've tried to explore the relationship between animal rights and cognate disciplines and approaches. In September 2020, we organised the workshop Ravens and Rivers, debating the rights of animals and nature. And in that workshop, we focused on the relationship between animals and the rights of nature. You can watch the recording of the uh, workshop on our website, www.animalrightslaw.org, if you're interested in it. In today's workshop, we will explore the relationship between animal rights and the rights of artificial intelligences. Now, before saying a few more words about today's workshop, I would like to briefly explain the format of this event. Uh, in case you haven't noticed already, we are using Zoom webinar, which allows all of our attendees to listen to the fascinating presentations that we'll be hearing from our speakers without having to share video or audio themselves. Now, as a member of the audience, you will still be able to interact with our speakers, and you can do that during the last part of our workshop, which is specifically dedicated to a discussion and to answering any questions you might have. You will be able to ask your questions using the Q&A function, which you'll find on the bottom of your Zoom app. And when asking a question, uh, please indicate your name and location first, so we get a sense of who you are and where the people are Zooming in from. The chat function, on the other hand, uh, will be disabled. Please also note that we are recording this event, so uh, you can always watch it later on our website or on YouTube if you, if you have to miss one of our talks. Now, the event itself will end at around 5.30 p.m., so roughly 30 minutes earlier than originally scheduled, and that's because, uh, sadly, one of our speakers, Kate Darling, she won't be able to join us today. So we'll therefore bring Tomasz Piaczykowski's presentation forward um, as well as the Q&A by half an hour. Okay, with this out of the way, let me now turn to the topic of today's workshop, the rights of animals and artificial intelligences. We have invited uh, three of the leading scholars in the fields of animal rights and AI rights to ex explore with us the relationship between animals and AI. Now, our aim in bringing these experts together is to enhance understanding of the relevant issues, facilitate discussion, and also build bridges between people who perhaps um, have only heard of each other before. But why exactly has our center decided to focus this workshop on the rights of animals and artificial intelligences? Let us start by considering animal rights law. Do we need a justification for focusing on the rights of animals in this workshop. We believe that there is hardly a question anymore today that animal rights law, which you can define as the study of the legal status and the rights of non-human animals, is becoming a recognized academic discipline around the world. The burgeoning scholarship in the field is published in leading presses and academic journals, and there are more and more university courses specifically dedicated to the rights of animals. Starting this year, for instance, law students at the University of Cambridge will be able to take animal rights law as an official elective course in their degree. There are also dedicated conferences, of course, and talk series, some of which are organized by the Cambridge Center for Animal Rights Law. So animals are on the map, no question, and having a workshop dealing with their rights should not raise any more eyebrows, I think, than having a workshop on human rights. But what about artificial intelligences? Is having a workshop dealing with their rights not some, somehow like, you know, organizing a workshop on the rights of unicorns? Now, we think it's important to note, of course, that the kinds of AI that we are concerned with here are not simple forms of AI, such as chatbots or typing assistants on our phones. What we are interested in rather is what is sometimes called strong AI, that is AI that can potentially learn and surpass any human ability, including sentience and consciousness, potentially. 
to be sure, there is agreement that we are still relatively far away from building these kinds of strong AI. In fact, there remain um, really important metaphysical and epistemic questions about whether building such strong AI would be possible at all, and whether we could ever know if they could actually think or feel pain in the way humans and non-human animals can, or whether they would perhaps just imitate it. Now, what we can say, however, is that the fast-paced developments that we're seeing in computer sciences, biotechnology, and related fields, they do seem to make the prospect of intelligent, autonomous robots ever more tangible. There appears then to be considerable agreement that even if we account for the puffery of Silicon Valley startups and the sanguinity of tech enthusiasts, that there is a non-negligible likelihood that someday in the not too distant future, protections about, uh, projections about strong artificial intelligence uh, might materialize. There is furthermore, I think, agreement that now is the right time to think about the kinds of issues raised by potential strong AI's ethical and legal status, because regulation should proceed rather than trying to catch up with innovation. And engagement with these issues has not been limited to just the ivory tower, if you like. For example, a draft report by the European Parliament's Committee on Legal Affairs in 2016 considered that robots' autonomy raises the question whether they should be attributed, and I quote, rights and duties. Now, my colleague Sean Butler, the director of the center, is an avid science fiction fan, and he told me about an episode of the television series Battlestar Galactica, where an AI humanoid robot was captured and subjected to harsh physical treatment in order to gain information and shown, showed signs of feeling pain. But can we say that this being was tortured? Uh, could we even use that term in relation to, to embodied AI, such as this robot, even one with apparent sentience? Now, we believe that one of the primary benefits of connecting people and ideas in the fields of animal and AI rights is the potential this offers for cross-fertilization that can help make headway on answering exactly these kinds of questions. Animal rights and AI rights both have similar starting points and therefore allow for fruitful comparisons. At the same time, they're also different in important ways, allowing us to draw lessons from their contrasts. What both animal and AI rights have in common is that they start from an anthropocentric status quo. Our ways of thinking generally and legal systems specifically are geared toward promoting human interests and they do so generally at the expense of non-humans interests. This is obvious in how we treat non-human animals as resources for human purposes. And there are also some indications that many robots and other AIs will be subjected to human interests. This anthropocentric focus, I believe, is telling ref reflected in the fact that even the fields of robot ethics and machine ethics, whose names would appear to deal with the ethical treatment of robots or machines by humans, are in fact primarily concerned with the ethical treatment of humans by robots and machines. Now, to the extent that ethical concern is contemplated for AIs or robots, it is not infrequently based on the view that humans should be prohibited from ill-treating AIs, not because of the AIs themselves, but because the offending humans might otherwise ill-treat other humans. Now, this whole so-called indirect duty approach will, of course, be very familiar to animal rights advocates, um, as it was the view adopted by Immanuel Kant on why we should not treat animals cruelly. Animals can't help should not be protected for their own sake, but for humans' sake. What animal and AI rights also have in common is that both of them have what is sometimes called a disruptive character. They challenge traditional legal and ethical categories such as personhood, rights holdership, and equality, and they force us to rethink them. This is reflected in the similar approaches that writers in both fields have developed to argue for protecting animals or AI for their own sake. A common approach, which we can call the meritocratic approach, draws on the animal or AI's properties and asks whether a being possesses the capacities that are regarded as morally or legally relevant, for instance, sentience, consciousness, or autonomy. And if the being has these capacities, then their interests are regarded as deserving or meriting of protection 
and consequently ignoring them will con be considered arbitrary. Famously, in the context of animals, the concept of speciesism has emerged to classify acts that arbitrarily ignore the interests of animals. In a context of AI and robot rights, a similar concept has recently emerged, with those who would treat AIs arbitrarily being considered human chauvinists in analogy to speciesists, racists, etc. Now, as you will see in some of the presentations today, there are also alternatives to the meritocratic approach, such as uh, approaches that attempt to justify animals and AI's moral and legal status based on their relationships with us. These similarities between animal and AI rights provide the necessary overlap we need in order not just to be comparing apples with oranges. However, as I suggested, there are also some important differences that advocates of animals and AI can learn from. For instance, AI may not run into a problem that we're currently seeing in animal rights litigation. Some courts have found, arguably on questionable grounds, that only those who can bear legal duties can have legal rights and legal personhood. Many animals are regarded as being incapable of bearing duties, but AIs might potentially be capable of holding legal duties thus overcoming this obstacle. On the other hand, AIs may fall victim to a problem that animals don't. Rights are closely connected to the idea of the individual who has a separate existence from other individuals and interests that require protection for that individual's own sake. Especially non-embodied forms of AI, such as mere algorithms, may lack individuality in this sense. They may potentially be able to fuse with other AIs in a split second or divide up into countless copies. As a consequence, it may be hard to identify them as individuals with individual interests and capacities that the law can protect. And in the case of political rights, giving the right to vote to an entity that can multiply itself would seem to threaten the very idea of one person, one vote. However, while animals may have the edge over AIs in this matter, AIs may have an advantage in potentially being, uh, being able to claim their own rights. Not only would they potentially be able to defend their rights in courts, but they could also create a social movement and take to the streets to change legislation and policy. Finally, to give one last example, AIs might run into the problem that their rights may pose a greater threat to human rights than animal rights do. The reason for this is that, at least on the meritocratic approach that I outlined before, AIs would potentially deserve stronger rights than humans if they possess the relevant rights grounding properties, sentience, autonomy, whatever we might take, to greater extents than humans do. Now, as I hope to have shown in this very brief sketch, there are still countless questions and issues in both the animal and AI rights debates that await further discussion. We will not be able to answer all these questions in this workshop, but I hope that the combined knowledge of the leading experts that we will have the chance to listen to today will help us get a better handle on some of these questions and potentially even allow us to make progress on resolving some of the fundamental issues. With this said, let me now introduce our keynote speaker. We have the great pleasure of having Mark Kuckelberg with us today. Mark Kuckelberg is Professor of Philosophy of Media and Technology at the University of Vienna and a Vice Dean of the Faculty of Philosophy and Education. Previously, Mark was Professor of Technology and Social Responsibility at the Montfort University and president of the International Society for Philosophy and Technology. He is the author of 14 books, including AI Ethics, published with MIT Press, and Growing Moral Relations, published with Palgrave. He is well known for his work on moral standing of non-humans, in particular robots. In his keynote address entitled, Is it acceptable to kick a robot dog? A relational approach to moral standing. Uh, Mark will explore some of these issues with us today. Mark, it's a great pleasure to have you and the virtual floor is yours. <laughs> 
Thank you, Raphael, and especially thanks for inviting me to this workshop. I think it's a very good idea to uh, bring together these um, two worlds. One is about thinking about animals, the other about uh, robots and AI. And I think there's much to learn uh, on, on both sides of, the, um, uh, of this. So I'm, I'm very pleased to be here and uh, to be in good company of, of the other speakers as well. So um, let me, uh, without further ado, start with my, my um, own presentation. Um, I will share my screen. So um, this one should work. And then if I go to my presentation and start it. Um, do you see my uh, presentation now? We see the presentation, but it seems to be in the presenter mode. So we also see the sort of subsequent slide. I'm not sure if you want to choose the. Oh, video. okay. Let me try something else then. Um, then I do it like this. And if I now. Um, ah, doesn't want to want to do it. Okay, then I, I share it, get my screen. Um, let's see how this could work. Like this, and then I do the same tricks. Is that better? This looks perfect. Okay, wonderful. Um, so yeah. Um, what I want to do today is, is give an overview of my relational approach to moral, moral standing, uh, which applies, I think, to both um, animals and, and um, uh, robots uh, or other non-humans. But um, when I'm, you know, when I was working on this, um, I thought instead of just only talking about the uh, the theories, um, I would like to emphasize and and focus on. Um, on more concrete questions concerning animals and robots, um, which I think is very useful to, um, uh, you know, for the theory and for the concepts. Um, questions such as, uh, is it acceptable to kick a robot dog, but also is it acceptable to kick a dog? Or how do we talk about dogs? How should we talk about dogs? Um, talking about dogs matters, and why a Canton dog should not be shot. Um, I think you mentioned Kant's argument before. Um, similar questions can be asked about robots. And I think it, it's in this kind of conversation uh, between the questions, between the fields um, that we can gain uh, a lot. And what I would like to propose today is that um, thinking about, is a claim that thinking about animals, for example, about dogs, uh, we can also talk about rabbits and other animals, but I chose dogs because they are typically uh, pets for a lot of people, and so they have the same connotations as the, um, the robot's dog. Uh, so my claim is that thinking about animals assists our, what I call, moral hermeneutics of robots. When we question, interpret, um, uh, dialogue about robots, um, one way to do that, and a very fruitful way, I think, is to go through animals, to go through the questioning of the moral standing um, of animals. So I will uh, show this today how that could work. Um, moreover, I think that if we think about robots and animals, um, this is not just about non-humans. Um, this actually questions the very distinction we make between humans and non-humans and also leads us to think about the moral standing of humans at the very least. So let me start with framing the problem. And um, a good way to do that is not to start from theory, but from the phenomena. And one phenomenon in, in this area is people who kick robot dogs. Now, while there might be some people who do this for fun to gain pleasure from it, um, most people who kick robot dogs uh, do this to test robots, to develop robots. Um, and, and so that's the reason here in this slide with uh, people from Boston, Dynamics um, kicking the, 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 the robot dog spot and uh, doing all kinds of things with it in order to test its stability. Now, why is this uh, a problem at all? Uh, maybe it's not a problem, maybe it is. In any case, what we see is that people 
react to this kind of phenomena as um, you know, being upset, being um, disgusted, uh, morally um, uh, disgusted by, by this kind of behavior um, and making claims about the robot that you know, we should stop kicking uh, poor spots, um, uh, kicking, kicking a dog, whether it's a robot dog or not, is, is wrong. And a uh, 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 more funny one, robot remembers this is why the robot uprising starts. Uh, so these are um, reactions, I think, that can only be there because we see the robot as not just a robot. At least these people uh, didn't see the robot as just a robot. So this is interesting, I think, as a phenomenon. And um, as a philosopher and interdisciplinary researcher, I'm really interested in how to explain how to understand and how to evaluate this. So first, um, uh, when it comes to explanations, um, a good uh, source is always science, of course. And um, what science does, I think, is in this case, not so much explain, uh, but more further develop the phenomena, further uh, reveal the phenomena that there are um, with regard to how we treat robots, for example, Science shows that um, humans can empathize with robots in pain, at least robots who appear in pain, robots that um, in this experiment get, get threatened, threatened uh, or seem to be threatened by uh, having their finger cut. Um, and so the response of uh, these uh, human observers of this um, was similar to a human hand being cut or being you know, under threat of being cut. And um, while the response was not so high as in the case of humans, the experiment clearly showed that uh, we do empathize with, with robots. Um, and other experiments that, that, um, uh, that show this um, are, have been done by Kate Darling, who unfortunately could not join us today, um, but who has shown that, um, that we do empathize or we do uh, in particular hesitate in her experiments, hesitate to torture robots. Um, so, for example, she um, gave people um, a, a player robot to play with, and you see the, the, the kind of robot on the picture. Um, people were asked to torture and, and that robot, and people hesitated uh, to do so. Um, another experiment was with hex bugs, very small robots um, that, that move around, and um, people were asked to smash them with a hammer. And again, we see hesitation. Uh, so people do empathize, people hesitate. So apparently the robot, um, at least for some people, is not uh, just a robot, um, but something else. And um, interestingly, as you see in the experiments with hex bugs, these are very um, you know, non-human looking uh, robots. Uh, so interestingly, this happens even when robots today uh, um, the roles today we have are, are nowhere close to the intelligence and complexities of humans or animals, as um, Kate uh, puts it. So, um, while it seems far fetched, it says um, for a robot legal status to differ, differ from that of a toaster, there is a difference in how we interact with these objects. So, this is very interesting. Um, other people who have been doing research on, on how we treat robots and how we treat Technological objects um, include Sherry Turkle, um, who also showed that, yeah, we, we um, as she puts it, we perform a certain connection with, um, for example, this pyro robot, elderly people perform this connection, um, seem to, uh, whether or not they believe it's, it's um, a, an actual animal or not, at least they treat it as such, they treat it as if it's. Um, uh, not just a robot. Um, so this is very uh, interesting. And the way she puts it in terms of performance actually fits also with recent work I've done on the concept of performance, um, but I don't go into that. It, in, in any case, we have here um, a body of work that clearly shows that people treat robots as, um, I would say, more than robots. Now, I think while science can really show this, uh, reveal um, this kind of behaviors. Um, I, I think we need really uh, for, the, for the more normative question to 
um, not only understand, but also evaluate. Is, is, is it good that people do that, uh, that they empathize with robots in that way? Um, we, we actually need philosophy for this um, more, more normative um, questions. And um, one way to put these normative questions, uh, certainly not the only way, is to ask the question of moral standing. So what about the moral standing of robots? Well, um, basically, if we look at traditional philosophical criteria for moral standing, uh, such as those we apply to animals, or at least some animals, for example, sentience and consciousness or self-consciousness, um, these robots are basically, uh, you know, they have the same moral standing as a toaster, um, no moral standing, right? So they're, they're objects, they, they are uh, instruments for our purposes. Um, and this is how some researchers also in the um, domain of robot ethics see them. For example, Joanna Bryson uh, has argued that, that robots are just things that we own. Um, at some po point, she used the word slave, which is a very, very problematic term. And even without considering that, she does think that robots are things we own. Um, and this is a kind of um, a view that, that if you ask people, this widely shared. Um, the only problem, the only issue, um, and, and I think the big issue is that, that when it comes to the behavior, when it comes to the actual way we treat robots, um, we, we, we don't behave like that. We don't behave like our uh, beliefs would tell us. And um, so one way to, to, to deal with that is just to say like, well, people who empathize with robots are plainly wrong. Um, and, and partly I'm sympathetic with that because personally I don't have, um, you know, in contrast to what some people might think, um, I don't have any intuition um, that, for example, this Hexbug or this Playo uh, robot, that, that they deserve moral standing, that, that we should consider them as animals. And uh, I think many people will agree with me. Um, but still we have this gap between you know, some people displaying their behavior um, and, and our moral theory, which apparently can only give one answer, and that is that these people are wrong. I don't want to do that. I want to say more about it. I want to further understand uh, mainly and, and then also make, make some norm normative points about this. Um, and I think as a society, you know, as, as robots get more um, human-like or animal-like, we will have to ask ourselves these questions too. So I think it's not only a question that philosophers should ask, but also a question that, um, you know, that, that all of us might be confronted uh, with, with someday when, when there's much more of this kind of behavior um, and, and feelings towards robots. So my uh, project called Relational is meant to, to, to do this work of understanding and evaluating and um, to show uh, you know, what this approach is about. Um, I would like to um, repeat some arguments which I already started to develop in my book, Growing More Relations in 2012, and which have then been further developed in uh, subsequent articles. Um, so what is my, my reasoning? Uh, first, I look at how people, how we usually reason about moral standing. So the, the, the usual way of doing that is saying that only entities of type A with properties P Q and R have a certain moral status, S. Then second um, you know, line in, in, in the logic is to say like, well, entity X is of this type A and has properties P, Q and R. Um, conclusion of the, this reasoning is therefore entity X has moral status S. You know, very, in terms of logic, very, very simple kind of argument. Um, but of course, the, the, the premises um, are very important as, as in all this kind of arguments. And um, so we will talk more about that, that soon. Um, but just to show what this means in practice could be, for example, say, saying only sentient entities have moral rights. This entity, this dog is sentient. Therefore, this entity, this dog has moral rights. Um, we can try the same with, with, with robots, and then uh, according to the same reason, this entity has no moral rights because um, the, the second 
premise is that this entity, this robot, is not sentient. Now, this kind of reasoning uh, looks perfectly fine uh, when it comes to this, this robots, and especially if we don't consider the phenomena I just talked about. But if we just, you know, leaving that aside for a moment, if we just look at, at, um, at the premises, then um, one question we can ask uh, as, as a skeptic, from a skeptic point of view is, um, how can we be sure that um, looking at this first premise, that all entities of, of a certain type have a certain moral status? Um, and this is really quite clear in the case of humans, at least that we, we think so. Um, but in, in the case of animals, it's not always that clear. For example, um, how sentient is a fish? Um, how much pain does it feel? How does it experience that pain if it can feel pain? Um, what goes on in the mind of an octopus? Uh, we learn much more about octopuses nowadays. So um, the science is developing there rapidly. Um, uh, it's, it's quite clear that octopuses are very intelligent, but how can we be sure that you know, they feel pain or don't feel pain? Um, uh, and this is, this is both scientific and philosophical um, problem to deal with. Um, and I, I think we cannot just uh, skip that quickly in, in our reasoning. Um, if we look at the second premise, um, then another question is, how can we be sure that a particular entity has the property P? So even if we're sure that having a property P um, you know, warrants a certain moral status, um, because all entities with property P you know, get, get the status uh, according to the first premise, then it's still a question how we can be sure in, in a particular case. Um, and, and one way to show that, is, and that's familiar, I think, to many people in the moral standing debate, is to say that, well, some humans actually um, don't have um, sentience, for example, when they are in coma um, or um, you know, some, some humans that are under development in, in the womb, they, they you know, might be in, in various stages of development where not necessarily all the properties, for example, self-consciousness um, is, is present. Um, so these two premises that we routinely use when, when reasoning about moral standing are actually very problematic once we, we look further into the epistemology of this. Um, also, apart from that and, and on top of that, I think there's, there's also a problem with the whole procedure, with the kind of moral scientific and moral philosophical procedure we are, we are following here, because what we're doing when we ask these questions and we, when we reason about these entities in this way, um, is that we actually take a lot of distance from them. Um, we we um, don't talk about particular entities as we experience them or as we're related to them. Um, we're actually doing something what I call a moral anatomy, um, something similar with, with um, dissecting a, a body where we no longer uh, or do not have um, a relation to the person that's there. Um, and if you want, I can also show you pictures of, of dogs here uh, to show this, of course, uh, these, these terrible things like vivisection on a dog um, happened in, in these times. And um, uh, you know, even, even as, as late as the, the 19th century, um, well, you know, in the, this previous section, you can only do that if you take distance from the particular the particularities of the situation in terms of the experience of that entity, in terms of the relation you have and the emotional connection you have to the entity. Um, and I think something similar we do actually when we when we reason uh, in a distant way about non-humans, even just the term non-humans, um, and of course the term machine as well gives us this um, distance. Um, and what we're actually doing in this procedure is not only taking distance, but also uh, we, we, we do a kind of philosophical operation where we um, no longer look at the phenomena, but where we try to strip away the phenomena and uh, go down to the, the, the essences or to what objective science says about it. So we say like, well, this actually is not a robot, but this um, 
or rather we say like, well, this, in, in, in this film, you know, this is not a human being, this is a robot. Um, and in, in, in real life, we say, for example, well, this, this pyro robot, it's not a machine, um, or rather it's, it's not, um, sorry to confuse you, um, it's, it's not an animal, right? So we, we answer to the people that treat it as an animal, like it's not an animal. Um, and, and, you know, literally or metaphorically, we strip it down and, and say like, look, this is a machine. Yeah? Look, look, the needs beyond the phenomenon. Um, so I think this is a procedure of distance and violence. Um, and what's missing is the situational understanding of non-humans, is, is our feelings, um, is the encounter with, with another entity. Um, and what's, what's there is actually a, a distance that can take such a form that it's comparable to, to a kind of God's eye point of view, where the philosopher, metaphysician, philosopher, ontologist, um, you know, looks at the world as a whole and, and um, sees or assigns moral uh, standing to different ent entities um, without really having uh, different types of knowledge, the situational engaged kind of knowledge uh, to them. So what I argued in the book then is that we need a more relational approach and um, I've also called it social relational in, in, um, um, in, in different um, settings of, of articles. And uh, recently I added also more that this approach is also more historical. Um, because one thing that I say that, you know, that follows normatively from um, this understanding of what's, what's happening here is that we should be cautious and, and that we should be cautious because we should be precautious because there is historical variety and there's cultural variety um, in the way that we have ascribed moral standing to entities. Historical variety, think about um, the fact that, that in historical times, there were times where, um, uh, where we considered some humans uh, as, as non-humans and, and thought they were slaves um, and, and, and treated them correspond, correspondingly. Um, there were times when, when dogs were treated very different than, um, than today. Um, and, and of course, uh, our, our relation to robots also changes uh, the way we experience them, think about them, uh, treat them. Um, in the future, it might change when robots get more animal-like or more human-like, but also in the present, we see already that, um, that some people really interact with robots as if they are animals, um, whereas others uh, don't, and that maybe this changes also because in, in, um, in the, both in the imagination and, and the real existing robots of 50 years ago um, were, were um, really looking different, where were less interactive, less intelligent. And so the, the, the way we, we deal with these robots also has a history. Um, the same for cultural variety. Uh, in case of humans, think about cannibalism, although that's a controversial example because some people say, well, there never was cannibalism or not in, in, in the forms we usually think about. Um, but I think examples that are much closer to the title of my talk um, is that even today in China, South Korea, Vietnam, and so on, um, people do eat dogs, um, and, and, and people in, in the West tend to be appalled by that. Um, so they're, they're very different attitudes, very different ways of treating animals. Um, also for robots, um, it's often said that there's this cultural variety between Western countries and Japan, for example, um, where robots are, are more accepted in, in society. Um, so, given all these differences, of course, one should not derive an ought from an is um, directly and saying that therefore, uh, you know, and, and give a specific moral um, claim. Um, but I do think that we can have a kind of meta ethical claim here, uh, and that's that we should, you know, better be very cautious, better, better take precaution um, before we, we fix the uh, moral standing of an entity because apparently things do change um, and, and vary. And so um, the, the, the claim I make, a kind of meta claim is um, not, not about giving a specific moral standing or not to a certain 
um, animal or robot, but, but to say like, well, better err on the side of giving too much uh, moral standing to other entities because you never know that you're wrong. Um, and given that people in the history have been often wrong about animals, for example, I think this um, is, you know, very, uh, you know, support and reasonable claim to make. Another um, uh, claim I have made is, uh, and this is more about understanding, but it also has normative um, consequences, is that there are various conditions of possibility uh, for a moral state's moral standing description. Um, and what I, what I mean by that is not so much um, this abstract transcendental conditions in counter Husserl, um, but more very concretely and empirically that our, you know, moral status description, as I call it in the book, moral standing um, ascription, that is depends on things like the language we use, um, the social relations we already have with certain animals, for example, um, the technologies we use, and so on, which already pre-construct the robot, animal, um, human, and so on, um, in, in a certain way. Um, so let me elaborate on that and, and focus especially on the um, uh, example of language. So um, if we move from ontology to phenomenology and, and, and related fields like hermeneutics, um, what we actually see is that the, uh, the, the names we, we use um, really matters. And um, so that, that when we are in, in the game um, of, of giving um, a certain moral standing to non-humans, um, we actually use certain words which already fix the standing um, even before we, we utter our sentence. For example, if I say to, uh, to, to the robot spot, then I already suggest that a personal name is kind of appropriate, uh, at least to talk about this case. Or if I say like the machine, then I also pre-configure already um, its status. So we shape, by language, we shape the conditions under which moral standing is described. And I want to show this more in detail um, in, in three kinds of ways. The first one is that uh, when we talk about and to non-humans, then personal names matter. So this was already the example I gave. Um, very good examples for, for this um, in practice are um, a kid grows up on a farm and um, first sees a pig, for example, and um, bonds with a pig, um, gives a personal name, uh, tells stories about the pig, uh, talks to the pig. Um, and so uh, a relation develops between the child and a pig that one could uh, call companionship or um, you know, uh, some kind of friendship even, um, at least as experienced by the child. Um, so this is one thing that happens, right? So if, if at that moment um, a philosopher would ask like, what's the moral standing of this, uh, this pig um, and the child can understand what the philosopher says, then the child would say like, well, this is my friend, right? So it has a, a status of friend. It's, it's not just um, an animal, uh, one could say, but that's already also problematic to say. So the, 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 the next uh, part of the history is that the, 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 the pig grows uh, stronger, bigger, um, and um, at some point the pig is, is, is um, moved to the slaughterhouse and, and killed for food. And when you ask at that moment, what is the, what is the moral standing of the, of the pig and the people involved in slaughtering, they will basically frame it as, as you know, the, the pre-stage of, of your food, right? Um, and they could argue, well, if, if you're going to eat this, well, this is what it was before, um, but friendship will, will not be there because what, what happens in such cases is that uh, people learn to, de, uh, you know, learn to, to not be sensitive, they desensitize um, uh, in, in similar ways as, as people who, who kill humans first have to learn to desensitize to this. Um, so th this is 
hor a horrible process, but what I mean here is that um, these, the, the names we give to non-humans and even humans, um, as I will say later in, in the talk, um, really matters for, for their moral standing. Um, and um, at least descriptively, and I, I think it's it's important to think about what what does that means normatively. Um, also, even the very word animal, for example, as Derrida pointed out, um, can be problematic there. And I can say more about this um, using Wittgenstein. Also, uh, I will not do. I will move to the last example within within this the important of language as a condition of possibility. And that's that we, we also have narratives. And I already said a bit about it when I gave the big example. So we, we do make narratives about um, animals, about humans, and also about technologies. For example, competition narratives, or love narratives, friendship narratives, um, or this grand narrative of super intelligence and, and singularity, um, where first you have the, the, the non-human animals and you have the, the humans and the next stage is cyborg super intelligence and so on so we have what when you have this narrative first and then you talk about moral standing this narrative will sh shape and pre-shape how you will talk about the, the moral standing of these um, in this case for example super intelligent machines um, and of course, fiction plays a big role in that. For example, um, this um, story of, of Wally, uh, uh, it, it, it's made uh, that you empathize or sympathize. One can also have uh, non fictional stories there um, that, that do this because robot designers often design for empathy, design that we, we have this kind of experience and relation to the uh, robot. So what we have now here is that we have a number of phenomena which we can understand by, by doing this exercise and by looking critically as what happens. Um, and I think these are normal, should be normatively significant um, because it's, it's clear that there are, are all these differences. So just to say the moral status, moral standing of this animal, this robot is, is X, but I don't consider other possibilities. Um, it's very problematic in the light of this. Um, at least we should be open to, to further discuss the question. Um, but of course, some people were not happy with that, and rightly so, because in our political life, in our communal life, we sometimes have to make decisions about non humans. And so we need also a more normative approach. And that's the, the last part of my, of my presentation, um, which is, is relatively recent, where I tried to, to, to offer such a thing. So normative approach, as many people who, who have responded to the rational approach uh, put it, would, would mean that we engage with normative theories. And um, I'm happy to do that. So what, what we then have is, for example, the ontology. So what does the ontology says? Well, the ontology could say that kicking a robot, or for that matter, kicking um, a, an animal like a dog is not wrong. Um, sorry, is, uh, the animal, kicking an animal is, is, is definitely wrong uh, because uh, the, the, we have no rules. But kicking a robot um, is not because there's no moral rule um, against kicking robots. And actually, um, for a long time, there was this absence of laws against hurting animals, both in the, the law of human beings or in the moral law. Animals would just not, not uh, figure um, it would be, would be absent. Um, so if we take this, uh, this approach, uh, we don't have that much to, to go by um, when it comes to, to condemning this behavior. Um, because yeah, there, there is no moral law, there is no legal law against kicking uh, robots. Consequentialism uh, leads to the same result that we, we cannot say much more about it than, well, it's, it's wrong because there is no harm and suffering on the part of the robot. So again, we, we don't have a way to understand or 
evaluate other than straightforwardly saying like, well, this behavior is um, it's not wrong. There's not, nothing wrong with it at all. So if we instead want to say that there's something wrong with it, um, we have to go to virtue ethics, I think, um, which has this indirect approach and counts these indirect duties, which is connected to the ontology, is linked to his virtue ethics. Um, and there the result is that kicking the robot could be wrong uh, because and when it does not lead to a good character of the human, uh, trains bad habits um, on the part of the human. So this might, um, as Kant argued, spill over to our dealings with men. Um, and, and Kate Darling already picked this up also in her work where she says that, yeah, the, the argument is that we become inhumane persons when we um, treat um, animals like that. And she says, well, this can be transferred to, to robots. Uh, we have indirect duties towards robots um, because of, of this, on the basis of this Kantian argument. I think this is really convincing. Um, so uh, it, it's really, uh, I haven't heard a good argument against this. Um, and what the problem with this is though, that um, to, to further uh, think about this, we need, uh, we need a bit more information about the robot. So I find just to say that we have indirect duties doesn't really look at, at what kind, in what kind of situations uh, does, does this question come up in the first place. And so this is why I look further into this, uh, what I call indirect moral standing. So I, I, I um, lift out this term indirect, uh, decouple it from duty and, and say like, well, this was an ind indirect, argument for moral standing or an argument for indirect moral standing rather. And um, let's now look at, at the details of this. Um, what could this mean in practice? In what kind of situations um, is this relevant? And um, then I made argument about the moral standing of personal social robots saying that, well, given that we humans are social feeling, playing and doubting beings and that what matter according what matters according to the relational approach is that we relate to our entities whatever else matters this should matter morally speaking um, we could look at situations and see how under certain conditions um, indirect moral standing can be ascribed so that has led me to formulating four arguments for giving indirect moral standing which constitutes sufficient but not necessary conditions. Uh, so there could be other reasons for giving moral standing uh, to, to robots or uh, any other uh, non-human. So first of all, I think if it happens that um, some humans see what happens to the robot as uh, being a matter of bad personality, um, bad habit on the part of the human being, um, so uh, basically the, the Kantian argument, well, yes, then indeed there, uh, you know, th that will be a sufficient reason to say, um, let's give indirect moral standing. Um, another reason could be that if, if humans develop a relationship with robots and uh, develop feelings of attachment and empathy towards a robot. So again, an indirect argument, uh, this is not about the properties of the robot at all, but about that human that has these feelings, um, which is then normatively significant and translated in, into indirect moral standing again. Um, another area would be if, if humans and robots jointly um, act and collaborate, where you could say like, well, if it's desirable that this collaboration continues, we could again um, give indirect moral standing to the robot because otherwise this is jeopardized. And then also um, cases, and this leads, uh, this, this, sorry, this connects again with the precaution argument, um, in cases where there is serious doubt about the robot's moral standing on the part of the human users, um, then in such cases of serious doubt and disagreement about this, I think it's important to apply the precaution principle and say like, okay, let's, let's give indirect moral standing. Um, even if we disagree about direct moral standing, and I said there, I'm 
on the side of those who don't want to give any any uh, moral standing. Um, but let's give indirect moral standing because hey, we are not sure here, or at least some people experience this um, uncertainty and doubt. And we should, uh, you know, we, we think that from a relational point of view and from the point of view of this importance of the human doubter and experiencer, um, we should we should actually take it seriously and therefore give indirect moral standing. And we see that this, of course, can, can be used also in the case of animals. Um, so if someone would uh, exhibit cruel behavior towards an octopus, um, play with an octopus and so on, then because of this indirect moral argument, um, it's no longer, um, it's no longer, we, shouldn't no, we should no longer be indifferent to that. And, and we could condemn it morally um, by saying that, that this, Octopus now has indirect moral standing because of that play, because of uh, this kind of um, behavior that's this dangerous and virtue kind of terms. Um, and what I did at the end of that, that paper um, on, on Teddy Bear, Bear 2.0 and, and um, where, where dogs are also really um, figuring in, in prominently. Um, is then to say like, what about humans? Uh, we should dare to also then, then say like, can humans have indirect standing? And to some people, this might sound offensive because they immediately think that, um, that my purpose then is to give indirect standing to humans, but no direct standing. And um, that's not the argument I make. So I say, regardless of the direct standing, or humans have, um, which like most of us, I hope, uh, I, I, I agree with uh, that, that humans have this direct standing. Um, in addition, we can give them indirect um, standing. And I think this is um, useful and helpful as a kind of moral backup, so to speak. What I mean is that it might be that because some ideology people refuse to give direct standing to humans, um, and uh, nevertheless feel empathy, um, doubt that humans have that standing or you know, find themselves in one of the circumstances identified in these four arguments. If that's the case, I think it would be great if um, these people would agree to give indirect standing um, to these humans because even if they disagree about direct standing, that would actually lead to, um, to good consequences or less bad consequences for humans involved. Um, also, in cases where there's absolutely no agreement in a group or in a society about direct standing of some humans, again, which is a totally regrettable situation and which should be avoided. Um, but if, if that happens and indirect standing could do some work, um, then, then why not? Because that could leads to, um, again, to, to, for example, no harm to particular humans. Um, similarly, if there is a technological context, and, and this gets us more towards artificial intelligence discussion, if there is a technological context where it's not sure if I'm dealing with a machine or not, with a bot or not, um, then it's, it's very important to have this, this kind of indirect status um, uh, possibility to, to give that. Because if you don't have that, um, you just have yeah, the uncertainty again about the uh, properties necessary for the direct uh, moral standing. And so in that case, I think indirect moral standing can come in again. Um, for example, the, the uh, so-called cruel behavior towards an avatar um, could then be, be condemned on, the, on an indirect basis. Um, so I think this, this, it's, it's good to have this uh, next to direct moral standing um, and, and specifically in this kind of cases. So to conclude, I think um, you know, there, there are two kinds of conclusions to be drawn from it. One is about the content, um, namely that a relational approach and an indirect approach can do a lot for uh, thinking about moral standing. Um, 
and, and, and especially, first of all, to, to understand the way we, we ascribe moral standing, and also to, um, yeah, to, to, to make some normative arguments on the basis of that. Um, but I think it's, if there's also a methodological conclusion to be drawn from that um, conclusion about how to approach these whole questions about moral standing. And, and that is one that, that um, lines up perfectly with the aims of this workshop, uh, namely that um, I think that, that these kind of comparisons between robots and animals, um, robots and humans also are really helpful uh, perhaps even indispensable for moral reasoning about uh, moral standing um, and shows that this, this is not all just about having a theory which is then applied to the three cases. No, there is a, methodologically speaking, what's happening here is that there are continuously comparisons between the, the, the three, uh, between the, the moral standing of humans discussion, the animals discussion and the robots discussion. So we try to understand and interpret um, phenomena, arguments, claims, uh, by moving through these different entities, um, by interpreting in each case what it means. And uh, so I think it, that, that constitutes a kind of multi-entity moral hermeneutics. Um, and my claim is then to summarize that understanding how we think about the moral standing of one entity is helped by perhaps only possible via comparisons with how we think about the moral standing of other entities. We have to constantly switch between the different entities um, and in that way we progress in our thinking about moral standing. For example, we move between the robot dog, the dog, uh, Kantian dog in this case, and um, the humans, and, and their potential indirect moral standing. So that's the, the multi-entity moral hermeneutics uh, I present. Uh, a moral hermeneutics that's, that's really not just about robots and animals, but that in the end also led us to questioning um, not only the, the, the dogs and the, the um, robots, but also the humans. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark, for this very thought-provoking presentation. Um, let me just see if, can you um, end your screen share there or, there we are, perfect. Thanks so much. I'm sure this will give us plenty to talk about in the panel discussion at the end. I have loads of questions myself, so <laughs> hopefully I'll be able to answer, uh, to ask some of those. But just as a reminder to our audience, uh, we will be moving directly to our next talk uh, rather than having sort of individual q a sessions so we'll be having a large q a at the end of the workshop so without uh, further ado let me now introduce our next speaker and joshua gellers who is an associate professor in the department of political science and public administration at university of north florida um, he's also a research fellow of the earth system governance project and a core member of the Global Network for Human Rights and the Environment. A former Fulbright scholar to Sri Lanka, uh, Joshua uh, and his research, they focus on environmental politics, human rights and technology. His work has appeared in numerous peer reviewed journals as has been cited in several UN reports. He is the author of The Global Emergence of Constitutional Environmental Rights, which was published uh, by Routledge in 2017. And then in 2020, Routledge just published his Rights for Robots, Artificial Intelligence, Animal and Environmental Law. Please join me in welcoming Joshua for his talk entitled Rights for Non-Humans in the Anthropocene Towards a Unified Framework. Joshua, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you so much, uh, Raphael, uh, Sean and the uh, Cambridge Center for Animal Rights Law. It's really a privilege to be here. <clears throat> And to be speaking about this issue alongside uh, folks that I've relied on heavily in my own work. So I really appreciate that opportunity to uh, give thanks for that, but also to have a dialogue with the attendees who, many of whom I, I uh, recognize looking at the list, but also a lot of folks who probably are coming more squarely from the animal rights community. And so I think this is an important conversation and I'm glad to be part of it. So if you'll bear with me, I'm going to start sharing my presentation.
and I'm going to go full screen for a moment here. All right. So uh, as Raphael mentioned, my talk is entitled Rights for Non-Humans in the Anthropocene Towards a Unified Framework. Um, my perspective, just to give you a brief overview, is I'm a political scientist. I've spent my career studying environmental human rights, uh, which led me to examine this development, which is the rights of non-humans, but more specifically, the rights of nature. And uh, I noticed a lot of people working on environmental rights began to look at this, um, you know, mostly from a legal perspective. And there's some early social scientific work as well by done, uh, done by people like uh, Craig Kaufman and Pamela Martin. And I honestly can't remember exactly how I came across sort of the, the machine question, but I think it was this. I think that I came across this tweet uh, talking about the robot known as Sophia, made by Hanson Robotics, which very provocatively was granted citizenship by Saudi Arabia several years ago. And so my natural kind of question seeing this uh, development was, if we are granting rights, legal rights, to clearly non-human entities that are natural, and yet we are also seeing, albeit on a much smaller scale, rights of social robots or humanoid looking robots, um, where might we profit from examining the intersection of these two trends? And so that's kind of the genesis of where uh, my work emerged from. And so quite simply, my, my question in the book was, uh, can robots have rights, given these two realities of rights of nature, which no one would ever mistake for humans, and then human-like entities that are being granted rights, albeit on a more circumscribed basis. It wasn't until I started diving into the literature, and that includes the uh, works by Mark, uh, by Tomas as well, that I realized that there needs to be a sequence of uh, issues that are dealt with. And the first of which is really vitally important to this discussion, and that is to clarify the conceptual relationships between all of these different ideas, key terms, and so on. And in particular, to try and make sense to the extent possible uh, of the relationship between the legal dimension and the moral dimension. Because sometimes, and I think this tended to be the case more so uh, on the on the issue of legal scholarship, uh, people wrote about rights without necessarily specifying whether they were talking about legal or moral rights, whereas the philosophers, the AI ethicists, tend to be very clear that in most cases they were referring to moral rights. And so I felt like it was important to establish how they relate to one another, just so that we could all figure out whether we were talking about the same issue and whether they have the same rules applied to them. The next one was kind of like Mark, and you'll see it in a little while, how I, I took from his work and tried to make it into a kind of conceptual framework that I think is hopefully useful. And that is, how can we take all this information, the questions, the debates, and formalize it in, in the kind of framework that would be useful for deciphering the conditions under which certain non-human entities, be they uh, technological or otherwise, could be eligible for moral or legal status. And then it wasn't until literally when I was writing the last chapter that I entertained the kind of question that Mark talks about at the end of his presentation, which is under what basis, in terms of a normative sense, should we afford non-human entities such as robots a uh, moral or legal concern? And so I had to think about very critically everything that I had said in the preceding pages to arrive at an ethic which would motivate the distinctions about the kinds of entities that could be part of our moral and legal universes. So I, I, I seek to do all three of these things in the course of writing the book. Um, but then I also noticed that there were some, I call them analytical keys. I also could think of them as, as tools which assist me and hopefully the readers in understanding where some of these problems lie when these thorny issues are an animated when we're looking at robots or animals or nature or anything else. The first is um, from philosophy, 
And that is the argument for marginal cases, which is basically looking at, in most cases, humans who do not possess a certain property that is often thought to be necessary for the ascription of moral status. Um, but then nevertheless, we find that these humans do have moral status. And so the question is, what else do they have? And on what basis are we able to legitimize their uh, acceptance as an entity worthy of moral status? And so I think that that as a, a matter of logic is very helpful because if, for example, uh, consciousness, which is often talked about as one of the properties that is deemed necessary for moral status, is not present or is present in a lesser extent in a human, then perhaps it's not the case that that is necessary when we look at other entities, and if so, why not? Another one, which is sort of an offshoot of philosophy, is uh, this idea of new materialism or new materialisms, which really gets at the question of agency and how important agency is in this formula. Um, and new materialists argue that there is agency all the way down to the molecular level, even though we think of certain things as static or inert, there is always some kind of movement at that very granular level that's happening. So it's not the case that there are certain kinds of entities that are more or less agentic in their capacities, because the issue of moral agency is, is really central to this issue of moral status. Um, and some people incorrectly say that only moral agents have moral status. I think, again, going back to the previous point, the argument for marginal cases proves that that's basically not true. Um, so I think new materialism provides us some insights into the question of the relevance of agency in all of this. And then finally, the one that I highlight a lot in the book is a contextual factor, which is the Anthropocene. The most important sort of observation from the Anthropocene literature is that this idea that there is a hard separation between humans and nature is and perhaps never was relevant or meaningful uh, because the Anthropocene provides the insight that uh, humans are now uh, in this new geologic age having an outsized impact on the course of our climate and affecting the natural environment. And so this idea that there are clean separations between the natural environment and the artifactual environment are in fact just artifacts of a kind of Cartesian separation that maybe uh, has passed its prime. So I, I take a lot of uh, consideration for the insights provided by the Anthropocene. So I'm, I'm approaching this from a very environmental perspective. This is a, a slide that I've recently added because I think it really helps to illustrate where these problems lie. Um, so you have a number of different entities that have already been granted rights. And I think that's really important to highlight here. Whether we're talking about moral or legal rights, um, clearly humans have rights uh, because of you know, the International Declaration or the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. Um, the, the language used, as Mark talked about, the justifications for humans as uh, entities worthy of moral or legal status. And that tends to be focused on a very circular argument, which is dignity. So humans have dignity by virtue of their humanness, and that affords them human rights. Uh, I gave a talk similar to this to a dignity law class, and even they were you know, pretty uh, open about the fact that dignity is maybe not the most intellectually robust way of uh, identifying what kinds of entities might be afforded more or legal status because of its circularity. But none, none, nonetheless, Dignity is usually brought up as a kind of uh, reason why humans have a special status in moral and legal universes. Animals, my reading is that the animal rights literature has been far less useful than the animal rights jurisprudence, especially from the developing world, which has tended to be much more progressive than the literature has. Um, and so again, Mark has made this point very clear, but. Uh, Animals tend, animal rights tends to look at things like sentience, intelligence, and then indirectly whether human emotions or human interests are part of the equation. And then it is on those basis, bases that animals might be granted rights. Um, you know, and my gripe here has been that uh, some of what Mark has already addressed in his, his remarks, uh, there's an epistemological question about how we know whether and to what extent animals possess these kinds of properties. There's the more philosophical question of which property is more important than the other. 
I am a political scientist and not a philosopher by trade. I don't allege to have the answer to that. And I don't think anyone else uh, is ever going to be able to resolve that. So I don't, I come down on the side of, as, as you might say, uh, guess at this point, that relations are more productive than properties because of these internal disputes about uh, the epistemology or the philosophy underlying animal rights. And then there's the, also the issue of inclusiveness. Um, you know, in the legal domain for uh, animal rights, uh, animal rights theorists never seem to be able to come up with a coherent argument that affords uh, a bright line or the largest moral or legal circle possible for animals. It always seems to hinge on wild animals, domesticated animals, farm animals, but never all of them at once. And so I was wondering why that is and if it's possible to think more beyond that, um, to hopefully look at other arguments that might provide us with some additional flexibility. The rights of nature has, and this is why I really, it's really important and I'm glad that the, uh, that this uh, the Cambridge Center for Animal Rights Law has, has looked at this because it proceeds from a completely different standpoint than humans and animals. Um, they have focused on the, uh, on indigenous ontologies and epistemologies, looking at kinship, which relates to this idea of relations. Uh, some of the jurisprudence has looked at the role of biocultural rights, and then maybe less satisfactorily, but also importantly, uh, sometimes, especially in Indian jurisprudence, we've seen just an utterance of societal needs being a reason why nature is granted rights. And we've had that happen here in the state of Florida, where uh, people who are not indigenous folks uh, have advocated for the rights of rivers. They were successful in passing a citizen referenda, but it's largely because of issues pertaining to the rights um, that humans have to clean water and the role that capitalism has played in facilitating the capture of that resource by companies like Nestle. So it has nothing to do with the arguments for human rights, the arguments for animal rights. It has a lot to do with um, whether humans are going to be continuously entitled to clean water, which is more in, uh, in line with environmental human rights, if anything. So the rights of nature are totally different from the arguments seen in the case of humans and animals. And then in addition to that, the rights of humans and the rights of animals tends to proceed from a very anthropocentric or human-centered way of thinking, whereas the rights of nature has tended to be more ecocentric or what one jurist has called an ecocentric anthropic perspective, which is that it is ecocentric in its sort of orientation, but while recognizing that humans are the ones making the kinds of decisions about who or what might be considered to have rights. And so it is on the basis of looking at these three areas that we see, I think, some interesting perspectives on how we can apply this to non-human, non-natural, artifactual entities like robots. And so, as Mark has already talked about, in terms of moral philosophy, we tend to see this debate proceed in, the, in uh, these two categories. There are, on the one side, people who advance certain kinds of properties. They say that an entity needs to determine or needs to be determined as having intelligence or consciousness or sentience or rationality or something like that, and that we just need to pick the right property, and that helps to determine whether something ultimately has rights. And then there are scholars like Mark, um, and David Cockle, or David Gunkel, rather, who have talked about the role of relations. And then there are some who have looked at both of these. Um, as you can see here on the left side, you know, I've provided a sort of a shorthand of, of different icons looking at the different kinds of non-human entities uh, that have been considered for rights. And a couple of that are, are important to highlight are the one at the top right, which refers to uh, differently abled people. And the reason is because uh, under certain kinds of properties, people who have you know, mental deficiencies of one kind or another might not be eligible for the full degree of uh, moral status that we tend to associate with human rights, uh, unless we go back to something like dignity and view all humans as inherently possessing human rights by virtue of that quality. And then the one in the center is a crab, which you never ever hear animal rights activists or animal rights theorists talking about. And I think it's a good hard case, not unlike an octopus, which Mark talks about, um, because uh, you have to think about why it should be excluded from moral or legal consideration. And so I think that's an important thing to, cons to consider as well. So there's this ongoing debate about whether it's properties or relations or perhaps both. 
So what I've tried to do in my book is bring together both the moral and the legal dimensions and try and understand how they relate to uh, personhood and then the status of an entity and then the rights that it might be eligible for. And so this is really messy. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it. Um, but I will say that you can see that different kinds of properties, different kinds of relations uh, relate to different sor uh, sorts of personhood. My main argument here that I wanted to highlight is taking a page from Mark's work that I believe that relational personhood, which is talked about in anthropology, fundamentally underlies other kinds of personhood. And then that extends to the status that an entity might be qualified for and then the rights that it might um, be eligible for or, or enjoy. And I think that's an important observation. And so this is sort of a more formal, legal, and conceptual way of translating Mark's work and trying to incorporate the legal dimension as well. So what I have tried to do is take that information, make it more meaningful in terms of how we could apply it, albeit in a more uh, contingent and context-dependent way. And so I argue that essentially three things need to be accomplished in order to get to that framework. One, which I think I spent the most effort on, and that is we have to resolve logical inconsistencies. So especially when we're talking about properties, how is it that certain humans are not in possession of certain properties, but also animals that arguably are in possession of those same properties are not afforded moral or legal status? Um, my plea in this book is nothing if not for logical consistency. Second, uh, again, taking a page from the literature on the Anthropocene, I am pretty explicit about rejecting these rigid binaries, which some of the anti-robot uh, rights people are, are shockingly still uh, adhere to in their own work. Uh, I think most confusingly in a paper that talks about post-Cartesianism, by uh, Abiba Birhana, and uh, she writes about um, you know, the importance of looking at a post-Cartesian perspective, and then somehow comes around and argues that that is evidence of how robots shouldn't have rights. Um, but I think, it, as I've talked about in the book, that paper confuses a lot of the issues are surrounding robot rights. Uh, and if you're interested, especially during the break, what I'm going to do is post a little link to a YouTube video I did, which talks about um, the arguments the specious arguments that are raised by what I call anti-robot rightists uh, and why they're wrong, why they're logically inconsistent and um, how we can move beyond them. And then finally, another point that I like to make, which is also uh, Mark kind of uh, touched upon this briefly and the people who are adamantly opposed to this project of even contemplating robot rights seem to always conveniently ignore. And that is um, that we have to be capable of receding our Western ideas about law and morality in favor of respecting and acknowledging indigenous and non-Western ways of thinking about the world. So that's another um, kind of emancipatory and what I hope is a, a celebratory project that's part of the book. And that is that we have to accept that Western ideas are not the only ways of thinking about the world and the entities that we share it with. So this is what I've come up with. And again, you could see already that this borrows a heavily, heavily from Mark's work and David's work. Um, I have come up with this sort of nested, what I call a multi-spectral framework for personhood uh, in which different forms of personhood still relate back to relational personhood. Each of these forms of personhood are accompanied by or undergirded by more or less of another kind of uh, concept. And so if you look at relational personhood, the context is really important and the physicality of the entity or group of entities are really important. So I don't specify a kind of threshold beyond which, you know, um, an entity is worthy of moral status. Other people have written about that, uh, looking at, for example, um, more of a spectrum based approach to, you know, the status of robots or animals. I say that it's just more or less based on the context. I don't kind of weigh in on, you know, what that number needs to be. Uh, you know, people like uh, Stephen Wise, uh, the architect and founder of the Non-Human Rights Project, has this idea of practical autonomy, and he has a, a scale of practical autonomy and these sort of categories. That's simply another way of thinking about it, um, although the idea of practical autonomy refers back to dignity, and practical autonomy is, is supported by 
consciousness, inten intelligence, intentionality, and things like that, which again, I argue are not productive ways of thinking about moral status or, or legal rights. So all of these things are considered within a social relational context. And that is sort of at the immediate level. So it could be familial, it could be within a household, it could be uh, in a classroom, it could be in a medical setting. And then there is the social ecological model um, or context in which these relations are taking place. That could be a religion, a society, a country. Again, I don't specify what the boundaries of that are, but I think it's important to think about this as these, uh, these relations occurring within a larger ecological setting, which I mean both literally and more figuratively. And then, like I said, I take at the very end of the book into consideration the fact that how do we determine which of these entities could fall within those categories? Um, and so I propose what I call a critical environmental ethic, which borrows from critical environmental law and wor work on the Anthropocene. And so uh, there are three dimensions to this. One is ontological, one is epistemological, and one is normative. Uh, I'm just going to briefly highlight some of the, the key aspects of it. Ontologically, I uh, hope to move beyond individualism in favor of what I call radical holism. That means looking at all vulnerable entities which are present in an open ecology, recognizing that some entities may be more vulnerable than others, entities being humans or non-humans. Epistemologically, um, I look at radical equality, which means that you could have uh, a robot being on an equal plane in terms of its uh, moral status uh, as a human, as an animal. It's, it's simply possible. I don't specify necessarily the, the specific conditions under which that will emerge. Uh, and then importantly, going back to the indigenous and non-Western ways of knowing, I consider uh, equally a range of rights foundations, none of which are more important than another. And then normatively, uh, a, a critical environmental ethic has to be ecologically sensitive. It has to promote justice and equality. And taking a page from the work of Anna Greer, um, I say that it has to consider uh, inclusivity compassion and resilience as part of its um, goals. And so I think that, you know, again, this is not the sort of end all be all of, of what a critical environmental ethic could be, but I think it's a start. And uh, I wanna also pay tribute to certain people who have thought about animal rights more critically. And in particular, I, I saw that he's here. So I'm really glad because I'm interested in his perspective, but I think uh, Brian Favre has done a really excellent job in his article in the Journal of Human Rights and the Environment, contemplating the possibility of an ecocentric animal rights approach. And I think that is a really productive discussion. And I'd love to hear more about that. Um, but I think that that's the direction that animal rights should be going as opposed to simply replicating what I think are kind of tired uh, debates over which property is the most morally significant because I think that ultimately we're not gonna come to a conclusion and it's going to wind up being very context dependent as Mark talked about. Um, so anyway, that's kind of what the a sort of broad sketch of what the ethic looks like. And then again, sort of as a response to the uh, anti-robot rightists, uh, you know, the issue is like, just like with the rights of nature, these questions are already emerging in society. One of the chief uh, criticisms that David Gunkel has talked about is that this is sort of a, a fanciful, you know, misuse of, of the time that academics spend on you know, important issues. It's a distraction from human rights concerns that are much more pressing. Um, I, I, you know, I think that's a lot of uh, intellectual gatekeeping that's unnecessary and actually kind of elitist. And so these are two examples in which we're already seeing the rights of robots emerge in, in reality. One of which was from a several years ago where YouTube was flagging uh, these videos of robots fighting and calling it animal abuse because it was, um, subject to YouTube's animal cruelty policies. This was, of course, a kind of category mistake, but the, the issue was that it was, the algorithm was kind of uh, inadvertently identifying these vi allegedly sort of violent acts among robots, not even necessarily implicating humans, but among robots themselves as exemplifying animal uh, cruelty. And therefore um, they were offensive to the standards of the YouTube community. And then more recently, um, there has been talk about granting legal rights to sidewalk robots, considering them as pedestrians to, and again, what's really important here is that they're not being given 
the full suite of human rights, which is another mistake that these anti-robot rightists often get themselves tangled up in, but rather in this very particular context of the sidewalk, certain robots are being given the rights, uh, certain legal, limited legal rights. And so the point from all this is these questions are already emerging in the real world. And so this isn't a, an issue about contemplating a, a fanciful you know, science fiction future. These are issues that philosophers, ethicists, and policymakers have to wrangle with right now. So uh, I really appreciate your time and attention. Um, you can see some of my contact information below. If you're curious, you know, and you want to check out my book, it's uh, totally free. So you can use the little QR code and scan it. It's uh, open access. And um, you know, I'm really looking forward to the Q&A at the very end of this workshop. And like I said, I'm going to post a YouTube video of my rejoinder to the uh, anti-robot rights camp at the end. So again, thank you for the opportunity to have this conversation. And I look forward to continuing uh, later today. Thanks so much, Josh, for the really rich presentation. Um, do let me know if you uh, cannot use the chat function. You mentioned that you want to post the link. Oh, there we go. It's already working. Perfect. Um, OK, so what I suggest is we take a short break of 15 minutes now and then resume with our last talk by Tomasz and then head right to our uh, Q&A and panel discussion where Everyone, again, as a reminder, feel free to either, I see some questions are already in the Q&A, um, feel free to write them down now or later if you like. We're going to pick them up in the, in the panel discussion. Okay, see you in 15 minutes. Okay, hi and welcome back, everyone. I hope everyone got the chance to use the bathroom or get a bit of fresh air as the case may be. Um, so we're going to uh, resume with our workshop here on rabbits and robots debating the rights of animals and artificial intelligences. And our next and final talk before the Q&A will be delivered by uh, Professor Tomasz Piaczykowski. And I hope I pronounced that <laughs> more or less correctly. He gave me some advice on how to pronounce it. Uh, Tomasz is a professor of legal philosophy and legal theory at the University of Silesia in Katowice. And he's also the head of the Research Center for Public Policy and Regulatory Governance. He is, um, in addition, the chairman of the Polish National Committee on Ethics in Animal Experimentation and the author of numerous books and articles on the philosophy of law, bioethics, legal methodology and problems of interpretation and the application of the law. Tomasz's most recent book in this area is Personhood Beyond Humanity, Animals, Chimeras, Autonomous Agents and the Law and was published by Springer in 2018. His presentation today is called Five Theses on Similarities and Dissimilarities of Animal and AI Rights. Tomasz, thanks a lot for joining us and the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Rafael, for this nice and generous introduction for almost perfect spelling my name, my name, which was probably not very easy, I can imagine. And, and above all, for having me here at this awesome event among such brilliant speakers and and participants, I, I really appreciate that. Uh, before I begin, please uh, let me confess that I'm in something that I would call an expectedly difficult situation of the last speaker at the panel, namely uh, several insights that I've, I've planned to use as, so to say, pairs of my talk have been already somehow exploited. So unfortunately for me, I, I will have to keep my argument rather simple and mundane uh, in a sense, in particular in comparison with what has been already said by, by Mark and Joshua and, and Raphael in his opening word as well. But at least the focus of, of what I'm going to talk about um, seems to me a bit different since I'm gonna uh, talk mainly about the legal concepts and, and ideas uh, with ethics and, and philosophy rather as a background. 
And uh, I'm afraid that after the, the previous presentations, extremely interesting and, and thought provo pro provoking, as, as you mentioned already, I may, I, I may appear rather conservative, which I'm certainly not, and uh, by no means I, I would like to be identified as, as one. I hope it, I, I will be able to make it clear that my point doesn't stem from any conservative inclinations, but, but rather certain legal heritage that, that we lawyers, whether we like it or, or not, have to stand on uh, and, and at least take into account. And uh, to some extent also from a bit different scientific and perhaps partially philosophical traditions that I feel affinity with. My speech uh, will be structured as five interrelated theses. I guess that uh, at least partially uh, they may seem to some of you in particular lawyers, but, but probably not only lawyers, as a bit self-evident, um, at least at, at, at first sight. Surprisingly enough though, the literature seems quite often to neglect or downplay them, in many cases rather unwittingly. And that is why I, I find it appropriate to, to restate and elaborate on what may and should actually appear uh, a part of the basic legal knowledge, even if relevant or, or indispensable to examine the advanced questions of robots and, and animal rights. The first of my theses uh, is of methodological or ideological nature. And it reads, the debates on animals and robot rights have to take legal and social context seriously. What I mean by that is, above all, that the most important and highly relevant context of the robots and animal rights, meaning legal rights, is the jurisprudence and has to be the jurisprudential conception of rights, rights holding that is actually deeply rooted in, in our legal culture and not very easy to, let's say, upend, even by very persuasive and, and sound philosophical arguments. At the moment, the, the capacity to hold rights is commonly tied to the conception of personhood. And that conception has been actually worked out throughout centuries of, of legal thought. It assumes that personhood is a legal status conferred basically on two types of entities. Firstly, obviously human beings. And at least since the mid 20th century, it became a hardly questionable moral tenet that such legal status is due to every single human being, irrespective of their individual qualities, differences, or, or situations that they find themselves in. Uh, that is because it is regarded as a form of recognition of moral value, as well as a precaution against possible horrors of depriving some vulnerable groups of people their basic human rights, as, as it notoriously happened across human history, we, we all are well aware of, of that. Additionally, the law invented the status of juristic or artificial persons to enhance some forms of organized cooperation of people. This idea of decoupling legal rights and liabilities of an organization and entity from people being its ultimate stakeholders has developed since late antiquity. And nowadays it somehow permeates both public and private law uh, in which juristic persons uh, somehow seamlessly operate and hold rights alongside individuals. Thus the first important and obvious similarity between animals and robots is uh, that they share the same awkward position of not fitting to the existing conceptual framework of the law. Rafael mentioned that already in his uh, opening uh, um, sentences. Moreover, in, in, in both their cases, the argument in favor of the reform of the status uh, of uh, uh, robots or animals presumably should not be based on premises that could too easily backfire in undermining the personhood of some, even if marginal only, classes of people. By the way, I'm not sure if Joshua's approach is totally free from, from such danger, but perhaps there will be some uh, time to discuss it uh, during the uh, Q&A uh, part. The fact that animal um, and the robots 
share similar predicament, this awkward position that I mentioned, doesn't entail it, however, that they, they should also share similar solutions. My second thesis is more analytic, and I would model its wording after the famous classic of the 19th century uh, legal positivism. Namely, the thesis reads, who is a legal right holder is one thing, who should be granted such status and why is another. Please note that in case of morality, the debate is principally over who holds rights because deserving to have a moral right is actually largely the same as, as having it. And as opposed to that in law, we have to distinguish at least two partially separate domains. The question who holds legal rights is determined by the content of the valid legal norms. And as such, it is the outcome of the prior decisions taken by the respective lawmakers, whether they are members of parliament or judges or um, governmental officials in agencies, uh, lawmaking agencies, or, or whoever. And most importantly, on that level, the lawmakers are free to attribute the status of a right holder to actually anyone or anything they please. There are no conceptual obstacles to attaching legal status and legal rights to non-human living creatures, to natural objects, to machines, or even imaginary beings. Nor there are obstacles to deny such status to, to anyone or anything, including people themselves. It is entirely up to the lawmakers' will and lawmakers' views. So legal rights are held in virtue of lawmaking decisions that may confer them on virtually anyone or anything, if only the lawmakers find it justify, justified or, or useful. And one may call it a conventional, institutional, or constructive dimension of, of legal status. And the second level is the one of reasons behind granting or denying personhood. Uh, they may explain the lawmakers' decisions, they may justify them, or underpin the argument in favor of what they should be like. Noteworthy, the reasons explaining and justifying legal rules are often only tacitly assumed. They may be so obvious uh, as a part of the underlying cultural worldview that it takes some effort even to notice or illuminate them. Um, after all, typically the lawmakers as well as we ourselves are immersed in the same culture as the legal system in which we participate. I believe that this perspective may blind us to at least some platitudes that may be important or even critical for the explanation of the legal approach to certain phenomena, including personhood and right-holding. Only from a historical or cultural distance, it becomes clear how the law is or was embedded into such a seamless, hard to notice web of tacit assumptions, and to what extent those assumptions were actually profound objective truths about reality, and to what extent they were rather accidental presuppositions only culturally taken for granted. What does all of it mean to animals and robots debates? First, there is nothing that renders it inconceivable for the law to grant uh, them rights, both of them or either, either of them. It is always up to the lawmakers and depends ultimately on their decisions and the considerations they, they find relevant. Second, philosophical argument in the law is never enough unless it can effectively influence lawmakers' minds. Moreover, these are not only views of a bunch of lawmakers that ultimately count. For a successful legal change, neurons have to correspond to a sufficient degree to the prevailing social attitudes and, and beliefs. Otherwise, legal rules may be difficult to be adopted and sustained, in particular in a democratic society and even if imposed, may remain on paper only, failing to effectively control widespread patterns of, of behavior. This is, by the way, largely the case of many legal norms protecting animals today. The more distant they are from the popular perception of how people should behave toward particular animals in particular circumstances, <coughs> the more significant the effectivity gap of, of such laws. 
Thus, the point is to strike a balance between the progress that the law should try to bring about and the relative consistency between the law's justification and the accepted values of positive social morality of, of a given time. Therefore, even if there are no conceptual constraints to granting rights to animals and robots, there may be strong factual constraints in form of the prevailing social expectations or habits of the mind. Even having uh, sound philosophical arguments to reform the law towards granting rights to new categories of beings or, or entities, it can hardly be done without prior changes in popular perception of what are the proper relations between human and non-human world. On the other hand, however, from the sociological perspective, once such social change happens, the following legal reform may become almost inevitable. I guess that, that this thought somehow connects my, my uh, arguments to uh, uh, what Mark told about this relational approach and uh, the outcomes of this testing. Unfortunately, the speech on that is, uh, will, will not take place today, but uh, we have some arguments that this social per perception actually is more favorable to, to the relations between human and non-human reality than the legal rules uh, uh, in question uh, at the moment. My third and presumably the most important thesis uh, concerns the remarkable difference beneath the superficial similarity of the legal status of natural and juristic persons. Thus, it is a kind of critique of the assumption that there is a uh, symmetry between legal personhood of human beings on the one hand and the allegedly analogous personhood of companies, associations and the like on, on the other. I believe that the standard description of personhood in law as consisting of natural persons and artificial juristic persons uh, is in some sense deeply misleading. It, often may suggest that the latter is a kind of equivalent of, of the former, that they are actually a twin legal institution just dedicated to different real entities to which a respective kind of personhood is granted. That is, however, not the case. There is an essential difference between them. Namely, a natural legal personhood of human beings is basically a way of recognizing the moral worth of each individual existence. The creatures are recognized as, to use a famous phrase of Jean-Paul Sartre's existentialist philosophy, être pour soi, beings for themselves, and not only être en soi, beings in themselves. That is why such beings deserve to be treated as having intrinsic moral worth, and the basic eman emanations of which take form of legally protected human rights. That's the axiological foundations and the very essence actually of the post-war legal spirit, so to say, at least of the mainstream liberal Western legal systems. To this extent, the debate of, over who are the creatures whose basic rights deserve protection is obviously and unequivocally moral. This nature can be clearly seen in the debates on such issues as abortion, as uh, extending the brain death definition, for example, or, or our duties to future generations. As opposed to that now, the juristic personhood of such entities as companies, governmental agencies, associations, states, and, and so on, is essentially technical and has only, so to say, indirect moral footing. Recognition of personhood is here a tool to improve the legal situation of the human stakeholders interested in, in, in what can be achieved by the establishment and operation of an additional organized legal entity. But the very legal status of such entity ha has only instrumental value as a means to morally recommendable end, mainly creating new ways for people to pursue what they want or aim at, uh, new ways to flourish for, for people interested in making use of this instrument that the juristic personhood is. Thus the shape and scope of juristic personhood is determined by predominantly pragmatic considerations. 
The moral argument is only far in the background and boils down to the duty of the lawmaker to design legal institutions in a way that will provide human beings with the best opportunities to pursue their goals in the manner safest to their vital interests. In view of that, despite some appearances, the conferral of legal personhood on various types of non-human entities has not yet been any deviation from, but rather remains an extension of the ancient Roman legal principle, which says humana causa omnis jus constituo mest, that means all laws have their ultimate reason in human affairs. Referring to, uh, in particular to what Joshua uh, talked about, I would still insist that no existing example of non-human personhood, of non-human legal rights undermines effectively uh, this view and this general, general picture. My next thesis draws on the above distinctions and claims that while animal rights deserve legal recognition for moral reasons, similarly to the recognition of human rights, potential robot rights much better fit the conception of an instrumental juristic personhood. The rational reason to conceive human beings as deserving recognition as persons uh, is our species typical consciousness and all related capabilities. Due to it, human being has its own subjective interests as an et pour soi, whose ability to fulfill such interests certainly matters morally. And as a cons consequence, it should also matter legally and does matter legally, at least on the ideological level of the main contemporary legal systems. I abstract from or ignore the, the practice in many parts of, of the world. Despite some controversies regarding marginal cases and average typical mental capacities of a human being seem to provide quite sound and legitimate foundation for, for their right holding status. Now there are robust scientific evidence that not only humans, but at least vertebrate animals are sentient creatures too. And therefore they have our own subjective interest in living a valuable life, corresponding to their species typical needs or inclinations. To that extent, they are also ontologically beings for themselves rather than for anyone else in particular uh, for, for human um, use. It gives rise to a compelling moral case for at least mitigating their treatment as, as tools used to satisfy human caprices. And the key legal instrument of such mitigation are just rights, making so protected interests capable of prevailing over at least some wants and trivial interests of people. The debate over recognition of animal rights is thus essentially moral, and its point is to recognize important similarities in ontological status of human beings and some animals, similarities that underlie the demands of extending certain basic legal rights onto sentient non-human animals too. Even if such animals were not to be included into the category of natural persons, but rather be treated as a separate kind of non-personal legal subjects, uh, what I find plausible and, and try to argue for elsewhere. The key reasons why animals' subjective interests should be legally protected at all are basically of the same moral nature as in the case of recognition of human personhood. And now, in contrast to that, the situation of robots is different. At least at the present stage of technological development, the question is not the sentience of autonomic agents or their capacity to subjectively experience life. One may say uh, as a catchphrase that while animals have sentience without the reason, robots seem to have their own kind of reason but without sentience. Thus the moment, uh, at the moment there is still no moral issue in recognizing robots genuine own subjective interest because they have none. There might be, however, legitimate and growing pragmatic concerns over their legal status, in particular in the context of direct responsibility for their actions borne by those human beings who produced or make use of them. 
Such concerns stem from the increasing extent of robots' autonomy. The more they become self-reliant, the graver legal risk for those who may be held directly liable for what their robot does. Machine learning and capability to develop unpredictable ways of performing tasks, still preset tasks, so to say, make this problem potentially critical for further development and uh, general usability of robotic technologies. Nonetheless, the problem to be solved here is essentially different than in the case of animals. It is to protect others from the perils of robots' autonomy, in particular producers and users of, um, of uh, autonomic or autonomous agents, rather than to protect robots themselves against infringements by, by others. Even if some concerns over damaging robots by people are actually being raised, they seem to be motivated not so much by an, by an idea of robots' own interests, but rather by malicious vices potentially demonstrated in such acts by their human, human perpetrators. It is here where I locate uh, marks for arguments for the indirect moral standing uh, of robots, uh, which I quite like, by the way, as well as the Kantian argument on indirect moral duties, which are in fact duties to humanity in, in ourselves. So irrespective of whether uh, these concerns justify adopting any special legal measures, they additionally prove that the actual reasons behind such ideas boil down ultimately to the concerns over humans rather than over genuine subjective interests and standing of robots themselves. My fifth and final thesis concerns in turn an additional remarkable similarity between the debates over animal and, and robot rights. Namely, in both cases, we have to address a situation that is evolving and, so to say, dynamically changing. Therefore, all regulatory proposals must be somehow tentative and conditional rather than aspire to be ultimate and perpetual. In case of animals, it is mainly the progress of knowledge that may easily overturn what today seem reasonable and well-grounded proposals to locate animals within the conceptual and normative framework of the law. At the moment, we have every reason to believe that vertebrates are sentient, but generally lack essential qualities that we are used to associate with the concept of a person, like self-consciousness, abstract thinking, or the capacity to control instinctive propensities by second order deliberate volitions. Additionally, there is no sufficient evidence of sentience among most species of uh, invertebrate animals, with a notable exception of, of uh, uh, octopus and uh, cephalophods uh, uh, as, as a species of, of invertebrate, special species of invertebrate animals, and let alone of their more complex uh, mental states. But we still know very little about the consciousness as such, about its shades of gray and uh, above all, uh, their exact relationships with neural biochemical processes taking place in the matter of the nervous cells in the body. It may very well turn out that we still have remained essentially ignorant on some important aspects of what sentience and consciousness are, what gives rise to them and in particular, how to accurately detect their presence. We will probably never be able to learn what it is like to be a bat, but nonetheless, our abilities to understand analogies between our own mental phenomena and the internal experience of various animals will probably yet hugely expand. Such progress, in turn, may very well entail moral implications, prompting, in turn, additional revisions of our legal approach to particular species of, of animals. Similarly, or even more so, it is the case of predictable further advancements in robotic technology. At present, we still have to do with so-called narrow AI only, and they are autonomic at best, rather than genuinely autonomous agency. But the potential emergence of agents that are truly autonomous and capable to behave like an entirely conscious creature could be a game changer, urging for 
further reconsideration of the proper moral and legal status. Thus, my argument about the profound difference between the cases for animals and for robot rights may hold only temporarily. As soon as the technology brings a new revolution changing the nature of artificial minds, my, my argument, uh, I have to admit, will lose most of its, of its power. So wrapping up, what makes the situation of robots and animals similar is that there seems to be no end of legal history for both of them in sight yet. Whatever legal reform may seem plausible today will most likely be made obsolete by the imminent further progress of what we know and what we can construct. It is impossible to predict when it will happen and how it will be changing our views on what the relevant legal rules should be like. Uh, but anyway, at the moment, we have no better option than to examine normative implications of the current state of the art, science, and technology, even if we are aware and must be aware that new important discoveries and inventions come up practically every week. Nowadays, as I claim, the basic arguments for the correct legal status of animals and robots differ in the most profound manner imaginable. However, the solution based on what we know about animals and what kinds of robots we can reliably take into account today, by no means should be treated as much more than just interim legal measures without pretensions to implement a final and eternal truths on the position that non-human agents of whatever kind should occupy within our legal systems. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Tomasz, for such a rich and enlightening presentation. So with this, we are now moving to our Q&A and panel discussion part of this workshop. And again, as a reminder, you're all invited to write down your questions in the Q&A um, sort of app that you have on the bottom of, of your Zoom your Zoom app here. I see some questions are already coming in. Um, before I start uh, feeding those to our panelists, I want to pick up a point that was mentioned in um, actually, I think all of the, the presentations, but that I think due to the constraints of the, the, the talks themselves and the workshops, uh, you didn't perhaps have the chance to elaborate uh, on more. And, and that relates to the question as to what the relationship is with human rights, when we're talking about animal rights or AI rights. Um, Josh mentioned, you know, there's a sort of distraction challenge that people raise, you know, oh, you know, we should be talking about human rights instead. So, you know, stop talking about AI rights and animal rights. Now, I wonder if, uh, how you see this relationship? Is it really just a harmonious relationship? Um, you know, as been suggested to some extent, the more we learn about AI and animal rights, the, the better we will understand human rights, potentially the better we'll be able to protect those rights. Or do you see sort of potential conflicts also, the more we protect AI rights? Yes, perhaps this will lead to conflicts with, with human rights that, you know, and sometimes maybe the human rights will have to lose out. So I'd be keen to hear from any of you who would like to share thoughts on this, how you see that relationship. Is it harmonious? Is it conflictual? Is it potentially kind of both? Oh, if you wouldn't mind, I think I'll just take a first swipe at it. Um, sure. You know, I've I've actually moved away from using the phrase human rights in the context of this kind of discussion, precisely because, especially if we're talking about animals, um, you know, the I think there's this this gap between what we envision rights to mean on a popular basis and what kinds of rights entities that are you know non-humans would potentially be afforded. And so in the popular zeitgeist, and again, the anti-robot rights people, they characterize this discussion as the moment that we afford rights for robots or artificial intelligence, it will bequeath unto them the full suite of all existing human rights through all 30 generations of human rights. There is not a single person I'm aware of who has written on robot rights and who actually makes that argument. So it's something of a straw man. So the first point is, like with other situations, and I think Tomaj was sort of alluding to this, 
the kinds of rights that would be animated by the elevation of the status of a non-human would not be the sort of full suite of human rights. Corporations don't enjoy the full suite of human rights. Animals wouldn't enjoy the full suite of human rights. Artificial intelligence wouldn't, wouldn't either. The second thing is, I fully expect that there will be conflicts and we already see that discussion playing out somewhat because um, again, one of the ro anti-robot rights uh, arguments is that this is simply going to provide cover for companies to distance themselves from the accountability that they would otherwise uh, have. And on the one hand, I think that's a legitimate uh, conversation to be had. But again, some of that will be dependent upon the kinds of rights that are extended to non-humans. It's not going to be the right to vote. It's not going to be probably you know, the right to work. Um, but I think we're going to see some different forms of rights. The, this is where I think the rights of nature and the rights of animals are actually very useful. I think at a core, and I think Gabriel is uh, one of the people who's attending today, his paper, uh, Gabriel Lima and others looked at what people think are the most likely candidates for rights to be extended to artificial intelligence. And the number one was a right to be free from cruelty, which suggests that the first analogy would be between robots and animals. And in, a, in an email exchange I had with uh, Ishiguro, who's a famous roboticist, he pre predicted that that is the way that robots will go too. And getting to the rights of nature, I think that's also likely to happen. So the first right that we might see could be based on a right to exist or a right to thrive or something to that effect. Um, and so that could, as you have kind of laid out, lead to some conflicts, but that is the case with all human rights. There are going to be conflicts no matter what. So I'm not sure that adding a different kind of entity necessarily changes the fact of there being conflicts between different kinds of entities and the rights that they are afforded. Thanks, Josh. Would anyone else like to come in on this? If, if I may, just, just two sentences, uh, two remarks in, in response of, of your question. So uh, I, I would fully agree with the uh, statement that the more we discuss and uh, um, let's say find out on animals and robots rights, the better we understand certainly uh, why we have human rights and what human rights, uh, rights are. It is certainly a, an exercise in a contribution to, to a kind of demystification of, of uh, human rights. So to changing their understanding from some mysterious entities that we have in virtue of dignity, whatever it is, into, uh, let's say, some uh, uh, reasonable imp uh, 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 ethical implication of our mental capabilities of our consciousness and all this, let's say, philosophical um, surrounding of, of uh, these empirical qualities that, that, that we have. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, the, the, the fact that there is uh, intellectual harmony, I would say, uh, between uh, human rights on the one hand and uh, robot and uh, um, animals rights on, on the other, doesn't mean that there, there is no potential conflict at least in respect of animal uh, uh, protection. Uh, it is obvious that uh, the more anim rights animals have, the, less, uh, uh, the, the, the lesser scope of human rights uh, that can be exercised freely in respect of animals, like commercial activity, scientific inquiry. I, as you mentioned, I'm involved in this ethical review of, of uh, uh, animal experimentation. So it is a clear example of a conflict of something that is at least legally speaking a fundamental rights to uh, free exercise of your scientific inquiries, interests, and so on and so on, and the protection of animals in particular if you uh, conceptualize it in, in forms of rights, then it is a natural hindrance or constraint on uh, how you can make use of your human rights to uh, let's say, examine nature uh, in, in whatever way you like. Uh, in respect of robots, I guess that at least at the stage of technological development that we are in, uh, it is more extension of human rights than, than protection. So uh, uh, I think that the, the first kind of, so to say, rights that, that we uh, um, have to do in respect of robots 
are rather private law rights because uh, uh, we have this trade, uh, uh, let's say, uh, autonomous or semi-autonomous uh, uh, um, software agents that, that for example, uh, are engaged into, into internet uh, commerce and they create enormous risk for, for those who use them because they are now directly liable for, for everything, for debts that, that such uh, uh, bots or, or programs uh, can make. And as long as you control, you are able to control how they do it, it's easy because you, you know what kind of risk you, you are accepting, but the more autonomous they actually are, the more, the more self-reliant and able to learn they become, the, the, the risk grows. So probably the first stage, this is my, let's say, hypothesis, will be to um, assign uh, 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 robots or, or artificial agents, uh, that, that's the, perhaps the, the most cautious term, um, a kind of right to have their own property and have the, the, the legal capacity more than, than right to engage into transactions uh, on, on their own, uh, uh, in their own right, and uh, uh, to be responsible, let's say, with its own property uh, for, for uh, debts or liabilities, as in the case of limited liability companies. So that's why I, I, I see so much similarity between the traditional juristic personhood and what we need for uh, autonomous agents at the moment, but it is only temporary. So probably the next technological stage would overturn this, this uh, picture and probably uh, will pose uh, with full force, let's say, the problem of whether they are only technical rights or their genuine rights uh, to, to which such entities deserve having their own interests uh, as separate entities, uh, let's say, also in a moral sense, not, not only uh, this legal constructivist sense as, as we have to do uh, at the moment. Great. Thanks, Tomasz. Uh, Mark, would you like to comment on this? Yes, I would like to. Um, I have two comments. Like one, I, I really like the conflict question, um, but what, what are the main conflicts going to be? Um, I think it will be rather in, instead of in terms of rights, it will be more in terms of interests. So it's clear that um, interest of humans and interests of animals will clash. For example, the interest of the, the, the agro industry that uh, raises animals for food, food production, uh, that, that, that's, you know, that, that clashes with, with some basic rights of animals. Um, but I'm not sure if my human right is violated when I can't eat meat. Um, so, so it could be that, that many human rights can be preserved and that, 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 um, that there are not so many conflicts in terms of the basic rights, um, if we see everything as more relational, um, but that of course there will be political clashes of interest. Um, another remark, because we talk about rights a lot in this workshop, um, I often avoid the, the term as you've noticed, um, partly because it's not my speciality in the legal sphere, um, but also, um, I think rights is a great term when it comes to direct moral standing, and we should absolutely have rights, um, and, and animals should have rights and so on. Um, it might not be so useful when we talk about indirect standing because it, it focuses very much on the entity and um, the indirect approach um, shifts the focus to the, the person who has the duties and, and who has to do some things or, or should not do some things. Um, and when we think about the moral problems that we face, uh, for example, with regard to animals, uh, a lot, a lot is about like, you know, what what kind of duties exactly do I have? So it could be that that the rights of animals to uh, as sentient beings is is, is protected, but um, it might be not so clear what then my duties are and what I should do, what I should not do. For example, is it still fine to have farming where animals don't suffer, hardly suffer, but at the end kill them? And, and so, so I, I think the link between the two is also very interesting and uh, should not be forgotten. And definitely in the case of indirect duties, we, we, you know, we should also look at human persons and their experience and, and duties. Raphael, may I have a question to Mark? Of course. 
is it, is it allowed that we have you know also question among panelists that you are perfectly allowed yes go okay. ahead please mark i have just one uh, let's say not legal but rather philosophical question to to your relationist uh, idea and approach don't you think that it is in some sense uh, still uh, based on this anthropocentric let's say worldview in which what actually counts is with whom or with what we have relationship so actually it is still we in the center and uh, let's say the elevation of the status of someone else something else is just due to the fact that it is somehow connected to us so we are still at the center of the universe and the, the rest may be let's say only grateful to us that we uh, agreed to enter into some relations with uh, a, a non-human entity of this or, or, or that kind how, how would you uh, respond that's a great question great question i, I think um, i would make a make a distinction between um, uh, moral anthropocentrism and epistemological anthropocentrism so i do think that uh, by the relational approach i try to shift the, the the focus away from the human at the center in a sense that that it's 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 about these other entities that we are uh, that we then as humans need to be precautious about uh, that that we don't fix their status and so on. So I, I think it's a kind of openness that uh, that that puts the human out of the center, even if it looks superficially as if I look at uh, the, the humans mainly with the indirect approach. So um, I think we should go away from this moral anthropocentrism. But I think we. Uh, uh, we cannot avoid a certain epistemological and interpretative uh, anthropocentrism because all this reasoning and all this interpretation um, and, and all this experience that we bring in into this discussion uh, goes via the human. And so in, in that sense, it's a human subject is in the center. Um, the, the animals are not invited to this discussion, yeah? literally and, and, and metaphorically. So, um, and, and that's, uh, I think, a, a, a kind of anthropocentrism that is very difficult, if not impossible, to avoid, because we, we are the reasoners here. Um, but I think in the way we reason, we can avoid this kind of God's eyes point of view that I talked about, and in that way, try to avoid the moral hegemony of the human, uh, the, the moral anthropocentrism. Thanks, Mark. Um, I have a question here in the Q&A, which um, might also give you a chance to elaborate just a bit on how you um, sort of conceptualize this uh, relational approach. And it's a question from uh, Simon Bale, um, who's a PhD student at Aarhus University in Denmark. And Simon asks essentially, um, what happens if um, our relation or relationships with a particular being changes over time. Say we, you gave the example of the pig who starts off as a friend with in, in the case of the child, but then becomes just an object in the case of the slaughterhouse worker. So it would seem then that the sort of the moral status of a being, including potentially an, an AI, of course, or already an AI robot, would change depending on sort of, you know, what the context is, who they're dealing with. So sort of how, how do you deal with that situation? Yeah, yeah, very good question. And it comes up again and again, this kind of uh, basically relativism uh, charge. I think it's it, it's right if my, if my point would be about direct moral status, because then um, I think direct moral standing shouldn't depend on on the context. We want to, uh, in this case, protect the, the, the animals. Um, however, in terms of indirect um, standing, I do think that um, that we should take into account that the, um, this child has this special relation to the animal. And if, for example, I were the father of that child and I would, uh, in front of the eyes of the child, take away the animal, and, and bring it to the slaughterhouse, that would be, um, you know, um, violating that kind of indirect uh, thing that's going on with, between the child and the, the animal. So that it would violate, it, it would do something to that child. And for that reason, it would be wrong to do it. So I see the indirect as an additional kind of um, range of rights and duties that we can, um, at, and that, that we should take into account when, when, um, yeah, when, when doing our reasoning. 
And apart from that, I think it's important to understand these shifts in relations and how it happens. And, and if we say it's, it's, it's not good that it shifts from, from one state to another, uh, then, we, then we could have arguments about that. We could have, we could have arguments about like, you know, why is it right to, to treat an animal as, as, a, as a kind of pre-food thing um, we could talk about that, and we could also talk about robots. If, you know, why why is it wrong to to kick a robot and so on? But we can only do that, I think, if we fully understand that 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 it's not just about that robot or that animal, but also about how we treat that other entity and and how we talk about it. And then I think we can do that in a critical way, and also be aware of our own biases and our own. Uh, upbringing maybe that that frames already certain animals in, in certain ways. Um, for example, you mentioned you in your title you have rabbits in there. I mean, yeah, rabbits can be can be eaten in some countries. For example, where I come from, at the same time, rabbits are held as pets, and and all this tension to really understand uh, how how is it possible? You know, it's it's a sort of mystery in a way, and. And I think it's important to also, from uh, you know, for for moral philosophers to not only immediately put a normative argument, but also try to understand what is going on here and, and how is it possible that the same biological, you know, biologically the same animal gets both eaten and cuddled as a, as an animal. So that, that's what I try to do also with with this approach. That's very interesting, and to some degree, it's also reflected in the law, of course. And the ways, you know, even though the law set or the sort of animal protection laws in many places say, oh, you know, the, this law is based on recognition of, you know, sentience and it protects sentient animals, but then it re they, most of the laws really privilege pets, right? And it goes to show the sort of special relations they have with us that other animals that are also sentient have that property that supposedly matters, um, but they lack, right. those, they lack those relationships. So mm -hmm. from a democratic point of view, because uh, people have the, uh, possibility to upvote questions and the one that's uh, received the most upvotes <laughs> um, is Jamie Woodhouse's and Jamie Woodhouse uh, asks about uh, animal farming and given sort of how uh, horrendous the situation is with animal farming question is essentially what uh, each of the speakers approaches say about what we can do or you know what the sort of ethics with animal animal farming are So uh, uh, my position is quite clear on that. So it is the most horrific and, and horrendous, let's say, part of animal exploitation. And, and on the other hand, the massive scale of that and this, uh, let's say, predominant social um, attitudes that I referred to during my speech actually makes it virtually impossible, I think, to, to do something significant about that as long as the and this is the, probably uh, one of the best news in the uh, whole, let's say, animal rights uh, um, perspectives um, uh, is the development of clean meat or synthetic meat technology, because it might be a real breakthrough because uh, for, for not only for farming animals, but, but for animals, animal exploitation in general, because now the um, horrors of industrial farming as a kind of moral um, uh, alibi for, 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 for the other kinds of animal exploitation. I have a lot to do with that among experimenters who, who usually respond that uh, leave us alone because, uh, because the real problem and the real ocean of animal suffering is at industrial farming. And this is where you should focus your your efforts, let's say, to improve the animal situation and, and animal fates. Uh, but uh, this is a much more difficult opponent, let's say, in the sense that, that farming industry is extremely strong in terms of political influence, business uh, capabilities, and so on. And scientific community experiment, uh, of hard science or experimental science usually uh, thinks about themselves as a kind of a scapegoat, that the uh, 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 severity of the loss controlling uh, experimenting of animals as the result of the relative weakness of scientific community to defend against uh, animal protection activists in comparison with the real uh, 
let's say perpetrators who are who are and culprits who are uh, in the farming industry but are somehow immune from from any let's say efforts to 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 somehow mitigate the uh, 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 what they do so uh, in short my answer is that this is the, the the worst part let's say of what's going on with animals today but there is a, a strong hope or even more than hope i would say uh, that uh, over time, and probably it is not even very long time, it's rather the middle horizon, I would say, uh, uh, that uh, due to a decrease of the cost, let's say, which is inevitable of, of synthetic meat in comparison with uh, breeding living animals, it, it will have to be much cheaper in, in a, a um, close future, then probably it will be the, 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 the slow or fast ending of, of uh, uh, animal farming. Uh, perhaps it will shrink to, to, let's say, some slight part of uh, what, what we have today. And then it opens the way, it will open the way uh, for a serious discussion of ending animal, uh, animal exploitation in other domains, which now are overshadowed, I would say, uh, by, by animal farming. So it is difficult to claim that we should we should abolish, let's say, uh, exploitation of animals for, for these marginal, let's say, purposes, as long as we accept uh, uh, everything that happens in the farms. And, and we cannot solve that problem without, without having some alternative way of providing meat, because the, it is impossible to persuade people just to give up eating meat. They have to be provided without animal suffering. And it starts to be possible in in let's say like 20 or, or 30 years that it will be at least comparable if not if, if not much cheaper. Thanks so much. How about Josh or Mark's approaches? There's a question specifically also a sort of follow-up um, I think uh, directed to Mark about how the relational approach would deal with animal farming and if, if it would sort of count against the relational approach if it couldn't actually um, get rid of factory farming, morally speaking. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, it should be able to deal with, with factory farming. Um, I, I do think that from, uh, from a direct approach, there is sufficient argument to abolish the practice or at least, you know, radically transform it. And I'm, I'm all for that. Um, and I think we can also, um, uh, you know, from a relational point of view, we can explore this as a question about about shared things that we share with animals, with non-human animals, you know, like, like things like, like sentience and suffering. Uh, we, we all have these, these, uh, with these bodies and so on. Um, from, a, from an indirect point of view, I think we could um, look at how is it possible that this practice persists uh, and try to understand it and, um, uh, and look at, um, for example, the people that, 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 that slaughter and raise animals in this way, um, you know, how do, do they look at it and how come that they have this totally different moral perspective? Um, so try to understand that and, um, and also see what it, what it might do to, to their character you know, to, to deal with animals in that way. Um, also what, what it might do to our character when, if, if and when we eat animal meat, and um, once we know all this, once we, we are really aware of this, um, and so it makes me think about like the way people are brought up and, and, and so on. And, and this leads me to the conditions of possibility I mentioned. So um, I think there uh, we have, uh, we, we are brought up in, in what Wittgenstein would call a form of life, which, which encompasses the way we talk about animals and deal with animals and, and raise children. And so children from early age um, are, are, are given a language to you know, uh, that makes them not so worried about this uh, or are, um, are given um, habits also like meat eating in the family, see that it, it, it's normalized. Uh, they are desynthesized instead of, you know, um, in a sense that they, they don't see usually where, where the meat comes from. And, and so all these processes, also technological processes that, um, that create a certain setup in which these moral or immoral deeds are, are possible. Um, I think that's for me important to, to understand. Uh, I think that what, 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 for example, someone like Hannah Arendt has done for humans, 
for you know to understand how certain horrible deeds were possible i think we can do something similar uh, for for animals uh, and, and i think their relational and indirect approach helps us to to also look at you know what is this kind of moral experience of people um, what brings them to do this what what you know how what kind of barriers could be put in place to to make sure that this doesn't happen thanks mark josh so i think in social science parlance uh, the case of large scale industrial animal husbandry would be sort of a uh, a most likely case for the application of um, non-human rights of one kind or another. And using the critical environmental ethic that I briefly described at the end of my presentation, it would be unequivocal that uh, what is happening to the animals in those situations is a violation of uh, compassion, uh, certainly not ecologically sensitive or promoting the resilience. Um, and so I think that in that particular instance, it would be inarguable that the what's going on there is immoral, possibly illegal if we have rights in place, and should be ended. The more difficult question is the inclusivity piece and thinking beyond purely Western ways of understanding the world, where you may have you know indigenous or traditional societies for whom ritualistic animal slaughter of some kind or another has a particular uh, cultural role. And that's where I think things get a little bit more uh, context dependent. And so, you know, because you will have both uh, Judeo-Christian practices, Islamic practices around, you know, the preparation of animal protein, uh, but you may also have, uh, as I mentioned, you know, sort of indigenous groups that engage in some kind of animal slaughter for a culturally significant reason. Um, I think that is a much more difficult case to analyze than uh, where you're addressing issues pertaining to you know, large scale um, animal slaughtering and in, in um, slaughterhouses and things like that, where it seems like there's no argument other than the efficiency and ruthlessness of capitalism to sustain that particular kind of institution. Thanks, Josh. Uh, next question is from Sarina, who asks about whether it would be possible at all to develop a framework that applies to non-human animals, nature, AI, robots, and potentially extraterrestrial entities. And um, Sarina asks whether we could potentially use some sort of whale of ignorance device to come up with a framework applying to beings that we haven't even encountered yet. Does anyone have thoughts on this? Tomas. Well, for me, that, that, that's uh, rather an easy uh, question in the sense that, that uh, as, as, as was clear, I guess, from, from my presentation, I'm rather on the, in the sentientist camp. So for me, the sentience is actually the answer and uh, a kind of unifying uh, framework for all those cases. So as long as we have to do uh, with sentience, it doesn't matter whether it is a human being or artificial agent or non-human uh, animal or alien or whoever. And I like very much the idea of the veil of ignorance uh, applied here that, that uh, um, uh, irrespective of all other, let's say, circumstances or qualities, there is only there is only one, um, uh, 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 let's say, criterion that that should decide. Uh, but uh, 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 it had to be, let's say, um, uh, taken into that, 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 uh, there has to be taken into account that that the word sentience is sometimes uh, used as a quite an easy, let's say, um, uh, only apparent solution, because the, the, I mentioned about that, that we still are not sure how much we know about sentience as such. We know certainly something, but perhaps it is just the tiny part of what is to be known about the kinds of sentience that are still possible to be detected. We all know about uh, not only invertebrates, but all those, uh, let's say, 
uh, 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 guesses or suspicions about about plants or something like that. So at the moment, there is certainly no sufficient evidence for that. But the, all those evidence is based on certain certain pa paradigm, I would say, of thinking about consciousness as a, a product or byproduct of nervous cells and nervous system and so on and so on. Assuming that it is true, perhaps we know quite a lot about uh, what sentience and, and consciousness are. But we, all of us know that scientific revolutions from time to time happens and this paradigm uh, fall and are, are replaced by others. And who knows whether something like that happens with uh, all these mental phenomena, including uh, 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 sentience, consciousness, self-consciousness, and so on and so on, ability to feel pain uh, and all, all related concepts. So, so th there has to be a big reservation with the, with the idea of sentience because ima imagine that this, the, the, the phenomena of sentience is much wider than we um, suppose at the moment, that all microorganisms, for example, are sentient. So then uh, probably it would be simply impossible to uh, uh, um, uh, base any actually normative ideas on that, because it would be virtually impossible to take it into account that, that you know, uh, organisms that we kill on a daily basis because this is a normal course of our functioning should be somehow protected as, as, as a sentient creature, it was simply impossible. So only assuming that that sentience is more or less what we know or believe at the moment that it is, it can be a basis of the solution of all those problems and the basis of the unifying framework. But uh, if not, then the question remains open. All sentient aliens will be happy to hear that, Tomas. Mark, Joshua, would you like to come in on this or otherwise we'll move on to the next question. Um, and that question is from Brian Fabre, uh, whom we mentioned before in, uh, in the context, I think Josh, you mentioned the paper that is also now in the chat, if you're interested. Uh, Brian is at the University of Lausanne and Uernes in Paris. And he asks about the practical enforcement of the kinds of issues we've been dealing with and specifically to avoid anthropocentrism, Brian asks, how we could um, sort of interpret the kinds of, you know, either you know, legal rights or legal personhood that we're talking about. Um, how can we avoid anthropocentrism there, given that, say, judges will be interpreting these rights, personhood? And secondly, what about conflicts when we have to deal with sort of more and more individuals having trump cards, the rights that serve as sort of trumps? Uh, again, how can we avoid anthropocentrism when dealing with these conflicts? Well, I'll just say one thing about that. And thank you for the question, Brian. Um, you know, if there's one thing that's a takeaway, what I've hoped to have added uh, to the literature on robot rights is the sensitivities that come along with environmental law, environmental ethics, and in particular, this very critical approach to it. And the long and short of it is that we will have to devise a system and this is the larger project that critical environmental law seeks to accomplish that is capable of making decisions in which humans can lose. If that is not possible, then all of this is essentially for naught. So we will have to be comfortable with that under certain conditions, humans may not come out the victors in certain legal conflicts in order for that to actually be uh, implemented in, in reality. Thanks, Josh. And probably if I may add just one sentence, I, I guess that this marks distinction of, uh, let's say, epistemic anthropocentrism and the kind of, let's say, metaphysical one is, of, uh, is quite useful here because we cannot avoid this, let's say, epistemic one because we are the ones who reason and, and uh, take decisions, but it doesn't mean necessarily that all those decisions have to assume that we are more important and that we are in the center. Just in the same way as the uh, judge who is male uh, uh, doesn't have to take decisions based on the idea of male supremacy. And of course, it can, he can be biased, but this is the question how to overcome that bias or eliminate or minimize that, mitigate that. But, uh, but uh, 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 I think that the same reasoning could be applied here, that even if we are the ones who are to take decisions ultimately, 
uh, it is a separate issue on uh, on what principles those decisions are, are based. And uh, to this extent, we are able to eliminate um, anthropocentrism at least to a large extent. You know, to the, the worst uh, the worst uh, manifestations of anthropocentrism that uh, uh, anthropocentrism that that we have to do today. But of course. Uh, it is difficult to imagine that that uh, you know the the decisions or arrangements themselves uh, would be taken by by anyone else, and the the, the rules are are ours. So perhaps the the best account of that is uh, of uh, uh, Christine Korsgaard, this idea of fellow creatures, where she distinguishes these two uh, ways in which Kant's philosophy and Kant's moral law and uh, uh, being the legislator in the kingdom of ends and uh, being a citizen, so to say, of the kingdom of ends can, can be distinguished. So probably this is a, at least partial answer even on the most hostile terrain of that, which is the Kantian philosophy. Thanks so much. Um, our next question is from Emily Robinson, who is a high school student who's about to start law school. Thanks for joining us, Emily. Emily asks, uh, what your views are on whether sentient AI, once they exist, could only get rights after all other sentient beings uh, have been given rights, including farmed animals, or whether the sort of situation might be inverse, whether we might start by giving out rights or some moral consideration, perhaps along the lines um, that Mark has outlined with his relational approach, and then it would sort of be a chain reaction where uh, all other animals would then be protected as well. How do you see that relationship there? Well, I think Tomas may have, uh, you know, also some practical remarks to offer, but I'll just jump in by saying, uh, in my heart, it would be something where a standard framework would be applied that would allow any entity, whether it's Zarina's uh, extraterrestrials or this, you know, student's concern about this sort of ordering to happen, but in reality, what I think is most likely to happen based on what's occurring in the United States and other parts of the Western Hemisphere is that certain kinds of animals will be the first to receive a greater legal recognition uh, than they currently enjoy. And then the development, as I think Tomas mentioned, uh, of robots will happen so dramatically that it will force the hands of regulators, like we've seen in the EU, where they've been trying to get ahead of some of these concerns and in some ways received some substantial pushback. So while it should be an all at once thing that could uh, facilitate the questioning and then answering of moral or legal status for any kind of non-human, I think we're likely to see it proceed first with animals and then very quickly the question will emerge as a result of the technological development of artificial intelligence. I would like just to add that there is an interesting paper by Rafał Michalczak. This is the Polish, he's a Polish lawyer entitled Animals Race Against the Machines, which is precisely on, on, on that issue, uh, who will be the first. And uh, uh, um, my, my uh, view is a, a bit opposite, I would say. So I think that, that um, autonomous agents have pretty good chances to be first, at least in, in respect of certain rights, because they are there might be much less dangerous for, for let's say, uh, uh, human position in, in, in this social, let's say, ontology, because, uh, because uh, those technical rights that could be ascribed and probably will be sooner or later ascribed to autonomous agents are not dangerous to people. They are rather a, a, a kind of safeguard to human interests. So that's why I guess that there will be much less resistance to, to granting this kind of uh, 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 rights to autonomous agents because uh, it will not cost, let's say, human being too much. On the contrary, it, it probably it will be a necessary condition to develop further and commercialize uh, uh, technologies of, of autonomic agents. Probably autonomous vehicles might be the, the first case that they will have to be made somehow independent in their legal uh, uh, consequences of, of the potential accidents or, or, or what may happen to the owners or, or producers, because otherwise nobody will bear this risk to, to take uh, all liability possible for, for what will happen uh, 
out of control of any, any human being. So that's that's the argument why it might be uh, earlier in, in case of, uh, of autonomous agents, but not uh, uh, when we are speaking of these genuine basic rights uh, granted in virtue of, let's say, moral recognition of, of someone's uh, individuality or, or standing. Yeah, for, for me, it's um, it's more like something, you know, if, if we have a relation with it, then, then it makes sense to talk about at least uh, giving rights and so on. If not, then it's it's very, uh, it becomes very abstract. For example, the, the aliens that have been mentioned, but also um, wild animals that we don't see, don't know about and so on. Uh, as soon, of course, if they come into contact with human beings, then we can ask ethical questions. If not, I think it, it's, it doesn't make sense to ask the question. So, um, so that's, yeah, that, that, that is a critical response to, to, to having um, a very abstract and universal approach that doesn't look at how it actually uh, works with human beings. Um, and there, for example, in, in political uh, thinking about animals like Kimlika and so on, I think they are, they are more pragmatic there. Uh, they, they, they say like, yeah, first rights for animals that are close to us, for example. Um, so I think it's, it's understandable at least um, how that works. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Sean, you wanted to come in. Uh, th thank you very much. Um, I want to move to us sort of slightly picking up what's just been discussed, but broaden slightly. I mean, it, when Raphael and I, when Raphael first brought this I, you know, proposal, um, I, I was slightly taken aback um, uh, and, and probably used words like absurd or something. Um, and, and so my question really is um, whether it's helpful um, to use words like rights in relation to robots. Um, I, I take um, uh, Tomash's point that, you know, there's, a, uh, there, there's an instrumental value in granting legal personality to an autonomous car or something like that, um, because it, it, it allows, you know, um, uh, it, it tort and liability and all those things to come into play. But the idea that um, essentially some software, and I, I, I'm you know, returning to Mark's presentation, I'm, I'm basically of the view that all robots, um, however clever they appear to be, are toasters. So I have no moral compunction whatsoever other than perhaps sort of virtue ethics um, to um, switching them off, shouting at them or, or kicking them. I suppose my question therefore is, is it helpful that we even think about robots as having rights in, in, the sen in terms of thinking about animals having rights. In other words, aren't we in danger of using the same word where actually it's got very different meanings? Um, and, and, and the idea of a race towards who's gonna get, get rights first, again, um, uh, perhaps I, strikes me as slightly extraordinary. Well, this is where I kind of wish Kate <laughs> had an opportunity to chime in given her, her book, which I did review it. So I feel like maybe I can be somewhat of a stand in for the moment. But um, I, I think, again, this is based on my reading of, of how both legal scholars and philosophers have talked about the moral and legal issues. And it is not the case that I think we need to specify the rights right away. That's where if you go, you look at that initial uh, map that I provided, personhood is really kind of the first thing that happens and whether something could qualify for one or more forms of personhood. Uh, I think that's the first step that we have to look at before thinking about whether, you know, your autonomous vehicle is going to have, uh, you know, rights of, of uh, you know, the way that it can operate on the road and the, whether there are, it can have any uh, attendant responsibilities associated with its operation. But I think there's what, what Kate talks about is, uh, and there's a, a paper by, I think his name is Thomas Kelch on the moral or the emotive and emotional kind of dimensions of this all. And, you know, to maybe take a step back and uh, 
uh, Mark talked about this a little bit in his presentation. One of Kate's earlier experiments involving the, the little dinosaur toy really illustrates in spades, I think what's at stake here and the kinds of need to sort some of this out where people were you know, nearly breaking down emotionally over the thought of using taking a hammer to a toy. Uh, and this is something that they had just interacted with for the first time. So whether we want to find a lot of value in that or not, the reality is, and this is kind of what I think, again, what David Gunkel also mentions, is it's at least conceivable that there are reasons why we are having this conversation. Not that we're all strongly advocating for a particular position or particular rights, but even if you just take the kind of indirect Kantian view, um, you know, this is going to seem very heretical, but one of the, the, the ways that I was thinking about this when I was writing the book, and I ultimately walked it back a bit, um, but is relevant in my state uh, of Florida, we have legislation that has banned uh, the sale of childlike sex dolls. So that is currently illegal. You can't possess them. You can't sell them. Um, why did we do that? And that's a, quite, maybe sort of a rhetorical question, but if a robot is simply property, and I'm not saying that sex dolls necessarily or sex robots have a kind of you know, moral value or something like that ascribed to them, even if you just take the kind of indirect animal rights route, um, there's a reason why, even from a very explicitly anthropocentric perspective, we have already outlawed childlike sex dolls. That may be more for the protection of human sensibilities uh, and so less about the actual rights of the entity itself. But I find that to be extraordinary, um, that we've already now made that kind of a decision from a legislative standpoint where there are roboticists and toy manufacturers who are racing to make the most human-like sex robots to make it as maximally realistic as possible. And no doubt that will involve some very questionable, from a moral and ethical standpoint, forms uh, that they're going to be creating and hoping to bring to market. If we didn't care about the question of rights at all, I'm not sure that would be an important thing unless there was something about the interaction, the relations that Mark has talked about. Um, and so that's why I think the question of robot rights is actually important. And I, I make the broader point in my book of saying it's not really about robots at all. It's about rights. And maybe just one way of, of summarizing that was uh, from last week, David Gunkel said this during a presentation that I gave on my book at a conference that he saw my book as less being about, uh, or maybe both being about um, the rights of artifacts, but also the artifact that is rights, is how he put it. I, I certainly agree with that, but I would add just uh, one uh, additional clarification, because the Sean's question is the very central, I would say, for, for, for what we are talking about today. And uh, my response would be that as long as we are talking about moral rights, you are certainly right that, that we still are far, uh, it is still far too early about uh, uh, to, to consider it seriously. Uh, of course, it is very valuable and, and, and uh, fruitful to discuss it because it sheds a, new, uh, a, new, a lot of new light on rights as such that, that was Joshua uh, uh, emphasized. But certainly we are not at the stage in which we can seriously consider granting any actually existing robots any moral rights. But the situation is, uh, uh, to me, radically different if we forget about basic moral rights and start to talk about technical legal rights. And autonomous vehicles are a clear example, beginning from the very right of using a, of driving on a public road. Whose right is it? Of course, you can say that it is the right of the owner of the autonomous vehicle, that he can register it and uh, uh, um, he or she has a right to put his autonomous vehicle on, on the public road. But it might turn out that it is a sufficient solution only to some extent, because if it is your right and it is as long as it is your autonomous vehicle, you are liable for that. This is just your property. So, so everything that happens it goes on, on your account, account. And from a certain moment, it, it, much more pragmatic and, and 
probably the only feasible solution is to to switch our thinking into into locating those rights and and liabilities into that that machines without uh, 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 considering them as uh, uh, something similar to the basic human rights that that we attribute to to, to human beings because uh, uh, they are simply ontologically uh, for now at least different kind of entities much more similar to what we get used to like companies associations and all, all that stuff that that we perfectly know that they have no their own separate genuine interests but we attribute them rights because it is useful for for the people to uh, let's say not be liable for everything that their companies uh, enter into and 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 generate yeah, I would say that, that putting rights on the part of the robot gives, uh, it's, it's a very strong kind of moral consideration that you give, uh, even, even as a direct um, argument. So uh, I would rather focus on, on what the humans need and what rights that they have, and especially what duties they have uh, from an indirect point of view could be, you know, when, when if, if someone uh, does something to the self-driving car, for example, that there is a problem for, for the human. And, uh, and I would focus on that. And whatever happens in the future, of course, we don't know. But for now, I think to, to speak about robots and rights, it's, it's, a, it's a very strong form of moral consideration. We probably have, uh, have, have other, other ways of dealing with that. Um, based on the indirect approach and based on also the existing legal systems. But if you imagine, uh, uh, let's, let's imagine a very simple and quite, quite possible, I would say, situation of a medical robot. We have uh, this kind of software already that examines patients and uh, let's say offers a kind of diagnosis. And, and uh, we are quite, a bit step, I would say, uh, before the situation in which it could be quite feasible that such a medical robot, for example, could have a right to uh, issue a kind of recipe for, for a patient, as long as the uh, medical uh, uh, F, uh, outcome of this diagnosis is simple, straightforward, and not doubtful, where a human expert could intervene, for example. And this situation could be legally speaking right uh, uh, similar to the the one that that professional um, physicians have to issue these recipes and uh, um, allow let's say patients to, to to buy some drugs that are only uh, uh, available on, on that recipe uh, 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 but of course it would have nothing to do with those serious rights uh, uh, in moral sense that that comes together with with a kind of recognition of, let's say, certain status that is comparable to, to, to the one that we occupy. So th these are two different dimensions. Yes, moral rights and legal rights. Um, and, and also to make sure that um, in the end, there is accountability on the part of the humans here in that medical example. Thanks. Um... I have a clarification question here from Camille Mamak, and it goes to Mark. And it's essentially a question about whether you are talking about robots in general or particular robots. And perhaps I can add my own question to that, Mark, and ask you um, if we assume that there were sort of strong AI or sort of AI with sentience, would you still see your relational approach as? A sort of would it be a backup or would it be replaced by a properties approach or what what will its role be in that sort of you know future hypothetical scenario where they do actually obtain sentience what we then actually have to be concerned about as you know camille puts it random robots and not just robots we happen to have a relationship with yes so if if that happens, right, it's a big if, but, but if that happens, then um, we would find ourselves in the same situation as now with, with animals, that we, we talk about animals in general and apply some framework there that's, that's direct, like symptoms. And in addition, we, we have, I think, also this indirect um, uh, approach, which, which gives additional protections. So um, I, I think that's the situation we would be in, in there. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks for clarifying. 
Um, we have a question also from a phone number who's asking about robots designed to carry out dangerous operations such as detecting and making safe uh, landmines. How, how will we approach that kind of robot? And perhaps we can tie together with Phil Wayne's question about whether we think in the case of robots, we will see a sort of hierarchy emerging with you know, certain robots that might be more comparable to how we treat companion animals now and others being more like we treat farmed animals. Do you see that sort of on the horizon or perhaps already happening now? Uh, for me, there is just one uh, potential morally relevant distinction, let's say, among robots, whether they are sentient or, 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 or toasters, uh, to put it simply and using this uh, analogy that Sean proposed. Uh, and uh, referring to the first of those two, two, two questions, uh, the, at least those robots to detect mines that we use today are just more uh, complex and complicated toasters. So there is no moral concern that it can be destroyed by, by, by those mines. Uh, and from the moment that it, it, it starts to be sentient or even conscious and uh, the moral concerns arises, then of course th this would be very problematic to send such an entity for a dangerous uh, um, let's say task or activity without prior consent because uh, from the moment that we have to do with a conscious machine then of course uh, we can we can think in in terms of let's say volitions decisions free will and so on and so on this goes together so as long as we don't have it and we still don't have it and perhaps it will still take a lot of time before it, it, it appeared, if, if any time in the future. But, but if it appears, then of course, they're all categories that we know from, let's say, uh, disposing people to, to this dangerous task would apply to, 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 to those, uh, those machines. So again, there is just one basic distinction and pot potential hierarchy. Machines that are not sentient or conscious as today or those that, that get moral standing by virtue of, of getting some kind of sentience or, or consciousness or ability to, to, let's say, have their own um, well-being and their own interests, uh, which follow of, of, of such well-being. If I may quickly respond to Tomas again, just very, very quickly. I think the situation is a bit more complicated because with military robots, for example, we see that the, the soldiers start empathizing with the robot and, and develop bonds um, with them. So it's, which gets my indirect approach going. So it, it's more complicated. I agree that it, it might be problematic, not only because of the robot itself, but also people who have some, let's say, emotional or re relational attitude towards that. OK, uh, we have perhaps time for one or two more questions. Um, the first question here is from Anna Moraiti. And Anna asks about the sort of other side of the coin here, about criminal liability responsibilities for AIs, potentially for animals as well. And she suggests here that practical autonomy seems to be what's um, sort of decisive. And she asks sort of maybe that's different, um, you know, when we're thinking about liability than, we're, than when we are thinking about legal rights. Do you have any thoughts on this? Um, yes, I, I think that this is a, a part of the problem of liability, although much more complicated and advanced because this kind of, let's say, tort liability or contract liability that, that, that I had in mind primarily and which is mostly discussed in, in terms of granting some kind of juristic personhood to at least those most um, autonomized uh, uh, mm, uh, artificial agents. Um, it's, it's easy because there is no moral component. This is just a question of having certain, let's say, property that is the uh, um, limit of, of potential liability for debts, for example. And there is no moral uh, problem with that. So, as, as for example, this is similar to insurance, actually. If you have an autonomous vehicle and it creates a, a, a damage to, to, to someone, uh, the question is who pays and if you need to, let's say, 
create a certain deposit of money to make this vehicle liable using that deposit, uh, there is no moral, let's say, uh, problem involved apart from the fact that the deposit might be not sufficient, for example, to re repair and, and uh, reimburse all, all those damages. In case of criminal liability, we usually have a kind of moral component that that we feel that someone is blamed for, for a wrongdoing, for, for a crime. So we punish him not only to, let's say, repair what the, the wrong or, 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 or harm that has been done, but actually to punish him uh, in order to, let's say, get justice done. And it is more complicated in terms of, of artificial agents. And I guess that as long as we don't achieve, let's say, the level of consciousness that we can plausibly talk about culpability uh, and, and ability, let's say, to freely decide whether to commit a crime, understand the concept of crime, first of all, there is no place for any kind of criminal liability for, uh, for artificial agents. So I think that there is a difference between uh, a liability as such and this particular uh, way in which in which we make criminals liable for, for, for crimes. I can just add one quick thing to that, which is, and I'm not certainly an expert in this area, but I found um, Ryan Abbott's book, The Reasonable Robot, uh, a very small, uh, in terms of how, how long it is, but like powerful introduction to some of these kinds of legal issues. And he specifically has, I think a whole chapter on the criminal liability issue. And he talks about strict liability and, and that sort of thing. So for someone like me who was coming at that question, and I was admittedly less interested in that dimension, it's definitely an important question. And I thought he did an excellent job of explaining the contours of it in the context of artificial intelligence and how we might proceed to still accomplish the goals of criminal liability with a more uh, causally difficult uh, agent that we're dealing with. Thanks. Okay, um, I'm going to just pick more or less randomly or based on my own self interest one last question here. Um, and it's a question from Oliver Bridge at Oxford Brooks University. And Oliver asks about the sort of room for an ecocentric perspective that we might or might not find under and that's sort of how I interpret this question here under the relationalist approach. Um, aren't we still being anthropocentric in basically starting from an agent sort of perspective, we perhaps bond with other agents, we find it very hard to perhaps form a rela relationship with a system more generally or an ecosystem. So is there room at all? And perhaps this gives our keynote speaker here the, the chance to say a few final words. Uh, is there room in the relational approach for such ecocentric perspectives or is it actually quite individual agent centric and therefore potentially also anthropocentric going back to what Tomasz raised before? Yeah, very good question. Um, I think we, um, so there, there are two things going on when we um, see how humans deals with, deal with that here. On the one hand, there is um, a response in terms of relationality and emotionality to particular agents that represents the more particularist uh, thinking in, in, in moral philosophy. Um, but there is also, we, we have the capacity to imagine and reason towards uh, bigger holes, lar larger systems uh, and so on. And so I think we, we can, um, based on, on, on particular experiences and imaginations towards specific agents, um, we can feed that into our imagination and our, our capacity for reasoning and in that way uh, come to a more um, overarching approach. However, um, there I, I would warn again for this God's eye, um, you know, very distant moral reasoning if that's the only thing we do. Yeah? So, so I think we, we need both kind of dimensions in our moral um, uh, thinking and, and, and I think if we delete one of them, we, we are doing um, you know injustice to 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 particular entities, but also to ourselves as 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 humans who who can do this both things who, who are emotional and 
and social relational beings, but, but also these kind of, you know, um, imaginers and, and reasoners. Um, I think so. So I think our, our moral system should reflect both dimensions. So this is a great question. And it was sort of the end point of my book. I tried to take what people like Mark and David had done and apply it with the sort of ecological sensibility that I'm coming from as a political scientist. And um, the only thing I'll add to what Mark said is that I think, uh, you know, not only is it, is it possible, but it, it involves some clever and innovative ways of retooling our moral and legal systems to include things like, uh, I, I raised the issue of Latorian assemblages, uh, which is, you know, this from actor network theory, uh, the idea that there are things that are kind of coexisting in the same sort of relational spaces. And so it wouldn't make as much sense to take a purely individualist view of rights, but rather what is the, you know, again, taking from Mark's work, the social relational, social ecological contexts in which these relationships are occurring. And that could be, you know, broadly ecological in terms of its orientation. It could be ecological from the standpoint of a particular culture and so on. So I, I absolutely see, and I hope to have accomplished that kind of uh, translation of the uh, relations approach into a more ecological perspective that also recognizes, and this is why I included the, the phrase anthropic at the end, is because there is no way to escape the human responsibility that we have to make these kinds of decisions. It is simply not the case that one day fish are going to tell us what their moral system is, and then they're going to subject us to a, an Aquarian court. So because it's the human responsibility to make those distinctions, we still have that, uh, that's sort of an inescapable fact, but we can be more ecological in terms of our own ethical orientation. Thanks so much. I think that is a great place to end this workshop. Um, we didn't get to answer all the questions, but I think we covered quite a lot of ground and uh, potentially if there's sort of any burning questions left, um, you saw the email addresses in some of the speakers presentation, I'm sure they would be happy to um, answer any final remaining questions. But um, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank our speakers so much for their generous talks and the time um, spent on responding to all our questions and comments here in the in the Q&A. So thanks to all of you for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you uh, took away something interesting from this uh, as I have definitely and I hope to see you all again very soon um, and again for those of you who are interested in continuing to follow our center uh, animalrightslaw.org you'll see that we're organizing quite a lot of events and um, there will be a summer break but we'll start again in the Michaelmas term so hoping to see you again there thank you again very much everyone for joining